so much for having me. And, uh, you know, I'll say that the, 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 the best part of the introduction is the end uh, about my wife, kids, and the dog. And you may actually hear the dog, so I apologize about that because I'm doing this from home. Um, what I thought I'd do today is um, talk a little bit about treatment strategies for coronary artery calcification, touching specifically on the met methodologies uh, that were mentioned. I do want to, again, thank you all for having me today. And um, certainly, I think it's hard for fellows, particularly um, many fellows who've come out of taking care of COVID patients, being reassigned, doing less cardiology, less intervention, and then um, going to a fellowship program where a lot of the educational activities are not the same as they used to be. Um, there are some advantages to this type of media, and we've been doing CAF conference via um, Zoom, and that's been actually in some ways better than the ones we had before, but we do recognize how hard it is, and that's why it's so essential to um, take, opportunity, take advantage of opportunities like this. So hopefully this will be helpful to you all. Um, just to mention, um, these are my conflicts. It looks like a lot, but in reality, it's all grants to Columbia and CRF, and I personally don't take any speaking or consulting fees, um, but you should know that these are grants that um, our institutions receive. So just to start off with, I think we'll start, and this will be a combination of data and clinical, and then obviously questions at the end, um, but this issue of an underexpanded stent is a real problem. And it's something that I certainly in my fellowship didn't, I think, recognize as much, but more and more now we're seeing it. And the reason for it is that our stents nowadays are far more deliverable than they used to be. So in the old days with this real bulky stent, if you had a lot of calcification, there's no way the stent was gonna go down. So you wouldn't go down the vessel, I mean, so therefore you would never have this issue of an underexpanded stent. Nowadays with you know, slicker stents, uh, guide extension catheters, et cetera, we can often get stents to places where literally you can't believe it if you've been doing interventions for a long time. Um, but the problem is it's not just getting the stent to where it needs to be, it's getting it expanded. And if you don't, then you have a situation like this where a patient with anginal symptoms has an underexpanded stent in the proximal LED. And that's a problem because the patient's symptoms are not relieved and they're exposed to a risk of stent thrombosis. So in this particular case, this patient came back to the lab, even the intravascular imaging catheter, and this is a low profile one, wouldn't cross. Balloons were having a hard time crossing, finally a one, two, five balloon crossed, and then ultimately even other balloons, um, 3O balloons, non-compliant balloons taken up to uh, what you're not supposed to do, but 30 atmospheres still would not expand as shown here on the right of the slide. So the question is, is how or why did this happen? And how can we avoid this from happening? Because clearly this is not a pleasant situation to be in as the interventionalist. And if you're not having a good time with it as the interventionalist, then you can imagine how the patient should feel or would be feeling um, if you're in that situation. So the reason this happened is because I think that most of the times nowadays, this teaching of what we're trying to do with lesion preparation has kind of gone by the wayside. So the whole idea of lesion preparation is to modify the plaque that we see in the artery and therefore facilitate delivery of devices, but then also to be able to expand the lumen when we put in the definitive device that we're gonna use, which is a drug eluting stent. Back in the days before we had stents, plaque modification was the only way you could take care of patients. And so there a lot of attention was paid to it. But nowadays, as I said, with stents that go so quickly and easily to so many places, this has kind of gone by the wayside. Um, it was funny, we did a case yesterday in the cath lab and it was a direct stenting case guided by IVIS. And even though the IVIS should not, did not show significant fibrotic disease or calcific disease, the stent still had a hard time expanding. And I remember telling the fellow, this is why I never direct stent um, outside the setting of acute MI or, or, or you know, a known thrombotic lesion. And so we need to modify plaque in order to basically get a larger minimal luminary and therefore expand our stent. So calcification obviously is a rock inside the vessel can limit your ability to not only get stents to where they're going, but also to expand them. So how do we know that patients have calcification when we're gonna do our procedures? So first, angiography, which is kind of the primary tool, can be used to detect coronary calcification. And there's kind of gradings of calcification from mild to moderate to severe. We're really focused here today on mainly moderate and severe calcification. And moderate calcification is generally defined is calcification that's only seen during cardiac motion on one side of the vessel. Severe calcification is you can basically see the entire vessel like train tracks, like a bone, um, when there's no dye injected. And that's shown here on the left of the slide. I'm not so sure how well it projects with zoom, but the bottom line is that you need to be looking for it in order to see it. Now, interestingly, despite the fact that we know it can make our cases harder and we know it can make outcomes worse, 
often carotene calcification is under-recognized. And so these are drug-eluting stent approval trials from a while ago. Um, many fellows now don't even know these studies, but Ravel was the first study um, that sort of looked at a drug-eluting stent, the Cypher stent. And I still remember being at that presentation at the ACC when a 0% restenosis rate was presented and literally was standing room only and people burst into applause. Um, I miss those days because we don't have meetings anymore right now, but I'm sure it'll come back at some point. Historically speaking, though, these approval studies have excluded patients with severe calcification. And yet, if you look at the bottom of the slide, 29% of patients enrolled in these trials that excluded patients with severe calcification had severe calcification when the angiographic core lab looked at the films. So it shows you that um, we are under-recognizing it. That's one of the reasons why we actually included it in this paper on the whole chip population. And calcium is clearly part of it um, because as complexity of disease goes up, complexity of procedures go up, you need to be able to recognize this and treatment modif modification strategies for calcification are a core part of what we tried to establish with the whole chip initiative. Now, as we start seeing older patients in the lab, more renal dysfunction, diabetes, and remember the paradigm of courage ischemia where we're sort of deferring patients for longer until they get more symptomatic or they have more severe disease. What that means is the folks that we're seeing in the cath lab nowadays have a lot more severe calcification than in those initial drug eluting stent approval studies. We talk all the time in the cath lab about how we never really see type A lesions anymore um, because many of those patients are managed medically up front. And in the syntax trial as shown here in the slide, 50% of patients actually had heavy calcification. So this is something we need to know how to deal with. So besides the angiog angiogram, how can we detect it? Well, IVIS can be a great tool to look at calcification. And basically what you see on IVIS is you don't see any signal beyond where the calcium is because the rock does not allow sound waves to penetrate it. So that's one, this is sort of more circumferential. Down here, you can see there's this calcific shelf right here with dropout in this part, but you don't see any of that over here because it's not heavily calcified. So IVIS can basically use to be look at the, to look at the depth of the calcium, oh, sorry, the, the arc and the length, but it can't look at the depth because it doesn't penetrate beyond the shelf. So you don't know how thick this calcific shelf is. Contrast that with OCT, where actually it penetrates and you can see depth. So this would be a vessel where if you looked at IVIS here, you'd see black, you'd see nothing here. But in this case, you can actually measure the depth as well in addition to the arc and the length. So OCT for calcification um, uh, in some ways is preferable because you can get additional measurements. The other aspect of this that's important to recognize is that if you use the IVIS catheter that's most commonly used um, in the US or the world, which is the Eagle Eye, it's a pretty bulky device. And so if you have severe calcification, the IVIS may not cross. OCT tends to be a thinner catheter and it still may not cross, but it probably will cross better. We also have access to lower profile IVIS catheters and for that purpose, they're basically equivalent to IVIS and OCT. So what are the implications of coronary calcification? Well, <laughs> we talked a little bit about it. Here are some pictures that are kind of interesting. This is SEM um, uh, image of the stent and you can see the polymer cracking and being debrided. This is the example of a stent that sort of crushed and um, got all deformed. And then these are examples of underexpanded stent by IVIS. Um, so clearly, it can cause issues getting the stent to where you want it to get, and then in addition, expanding as well. This is kind of a, a neat slide that looks at how stents expand in calcified lesions. And one of the interesting things that we often do is we look at that compliance chart that we see what that comes with the balloon or the stent. And we say, oh, if we go up to 14 atmospheres, this is gonna be a 2.5 or a 2.6 vessel. Well, the reality is, is that's in the bench. That's not in a body. And certainly it's not in a body that has a tube of rock around it. And you can imagine if the vessel doesn't have calcium, it would expand more. And if it does have calcium, it would expand less. And that's basically what's shown here. As the arc of calcium goes up, the stent expansion goes down relative to the compliance chart. So just because you went up to 14 and the chart says it's going up to 2.6, that doesn't mean that's what's actually happening in the vessel because that's determined by the compliance. And this is just an example of it. This is a patient who had recurrent instant restenosis. This post dilation was done. There's clearly a dog bone there. And when you look by OCT with, at follow up, what you see is two things. One is here's the stent around the outside. This is neointimal hyperplasia. You can see it's very homogenous and it's inside the stent. But the main reason that this is restenosed, as shown in cross section here, is because the vessel is like this and the stent is just a fraction of that. 
So the stent did not expand, and that's the predominant mechanism of restenosis here, not the neointimal hyperplasia. So if this patient comes to see, you, to see you and you see this and you put another stent in because you're just treating instant restenosis, you've actually made the patient worse because you haven't treated the underlying problem of the underexpansion. And that's why imaging is so critical in these scenarios. Now, beyond what happens acutely and what happens on imaging, are there data showing that there are adverse outcomes of calcification over the long term? And the answer is yes. Coronary calcification is associated with some of the worst outcomes of DES that we see with any lesion subset. Typically, when a patient came to see us back in the day before drug eluting stents, um, and they said, well, what's my chance of coming back to the cath lab? We would say, you know, 20 to 40 percent with a bare metal stent based upon your clinical characteristics, your lesion characteristics. With drug eluting stents nowadays, if a patient asks you that question, it's certainly 5 percent, 10 percent at a year uh, and certainly almost out to five years. But with calcified lesions, the rates of restenosis can be up to 15 to 20 percent at two years. And by the way, stent thrombosis is also increased, and that's presumably due to some of the underexpansion and irregularity of stents when you impl implant them in calcified lesions. So what does calcification do? Number one, it makes the case difficult. It impairs your ability to deliver stents. You don't expand as well. You get more malopposition and stent asymmetry. It increases procedural complications. There can be edge dissections, perforations, even guide dissections from the work you're doing. And then in addition, increased rates of stent thrombosis and restenosis. So clearly calcification is important. The why am I hammering this in so much? Because I think most fellows and myself included when I was a fellow only focused on the delivery aspect. It's just a pain to do the case. But these impact long-term outcomes as well. And that's why it's really important to be fast solid treatment strategies. So how do we treat coronary calcification? There are many ways. So here are some of them. NC balloons, cutting balloons, angioscope, laser, rotational and orbital atherectomy, and, um, and uh, IVL or lithotripsy. Now I will tell you that I did not put regular balloons on this. And the reason I didn't do that is because if you take a compliant balloon, which have good crossing profiles, so they get to where you wanna get, and you inflate it too heavily in a calcified lesion, what you get is differential expansion. So the calcified area doesn't expand because it's a rock and you're inflating a balloon inside it. But the non-calcified areas, which have lower compliance, can overexpand because all the air you're inflating in the balloon or, or the fluid, it goes into that other area. And so that's why that's not a good strategy except for an initial crossing strategy. So typically you're gonna be using these other types of things. Now, how can we actually get the, the plaque to be modified so we can expand our stent. Pathophysiologically, imaging studies have shown us that what we're really trying to do is to cause a fracture in the calcium. And if we cause a fracture, as sh shown here uh, via OCT imaging, that then makes a break in the wall and allows our stent to expand. And that's how we get what's called the greatest MSA, which is called minimal stent area. So the smallest area of the stent, which is gonna be at the most constrained portion of the stent, and the larger the min MSA, the larger the minimal stent area, the less restenosis and how the patient having to come back to the lab will happen. So how can we predict who's gonna need a strategy other than balloons? Um, there's some nice papers on this. Um, the easiest one to remember is one that looked at something called a calcium volume index. So if you take an OCT and you see an angle of calcification more than half the vessel, so greater than 180 degrees, if you see thickness greater than 0.5, and remember you need OCT to be able to measure thickness, and a length greater than five millimeters, those three things together are gonna suggest that a balloon is not gonna expand and you're gonna need to use something else like an atherectomy device or some other adjunctive therapy. You can also do the same with an IVIS-based scoring system, although you can't do the thickness as well based upon the fact that um, uh, you, it doesn't see through uh, the wall. So despite the fact that we know we have to create fractures, despite the fact that we know we have all these devices, what do the guidelines say? And remember, the guidelines are informed by clinical trials. It turns out there are very few guidelines that show that any device is better than another device because the studies are simply not there. You basically see cutting and scoring balloons, class 2B, maybe 3A, not for routine use. Rotational atherectomy and orbital would fit in this category as well. 2A for heavily calcified lesions, level of evidence C and then class three for routine use during PCI for other sort of indications. So really the data is sparse and that's something that's being actively worked upon.
what are strategies? Well, this is kind of a simple strategy. It's a pretty reasonable strategy to think about conceptually. And basically, it's if you see only mild andrographic calcification, you can largely continue with a conventional-based approach. But if you see severe calcification, then you're either going to do atherectomy or something else. And if it's moderate, that's where you use imaging to arbitrate to figure out whether it's severe or not. And if it's severe, then you use more dedicated calcific type strategies. This is a more recent paper in Jack Cardiovascular Interventions. It, it talks about deep calcium, superficial calcium, and it brings in uh, lithotripsy as well. Um, so this is a paper that you can pull up and look through. We don't have lithotripsy yet in the United States. So that's why I think the algorithm before, which really implies imaging to arbitrate is kind of um, what most people are using here. Now, one of the things that impacts the treatment is the fact that many operators in the US are less experienced. And that's just a function of the system that we have. And something that I tell fellows all the time is really important when you go into practice to figure out what kind of practice you're gonna be in. Um, because if you're doing a lot of volume, then you're gonna be more facile at it. And if you're doing less volume, in this NCDR analysis from Duke, um, basically 44% of operators did less than one PCI a week. It's going to be very, very hard for, for you to be able to use atherectomy in cases like that because you're probably doing it once or twice a year, if at all. And so therefore, you need to have a situation where there's somebody else who can work with you. And we do that even at Columbia, where we have operators working in teams for complex cases so that the first operator who's bringing the case doesn't feel like they're losing any education. But at the same time, we feel that the patient care is consistent, irrespective of who the primary operator is for the case. So what about other... Um, uh, other data that's out there for treatment of calcification. There's actually, this is a very uh, small randomized trial looking at cutting balloon versus conventional balloon, showing that you perhaps got slightly bigger cross-sectional areas with cutting balloon uh, and larger acute lumen gains. Um, but again, this is, uh, this is only preliminary data, and this is what some people would use potentially to justify use of a cutting balloon. How about other balloon-based technologies? Shockwave, this is investigational right now. Um, the study will likely be presented at TCT online, which is coming up in a couple months. Um, basically, it's a balloon that delivers um, through energy very, very high pulses, up to 80 atmospheres, to try to crack the calcification, particularly if it's concentric. So this is just an example of what you see on OCT, concentric calcification. After the shock wave, you see fractures in the calcium, which then will presumably allow stents to expand. And this is just an example of that. You see fractures here, fractures here. After the stent goes in, the angiogram looks much better and the luminary looks much better because the device has actually cracked the calcium. So the advantage of this type of technology is that it's a balloon-based technology. So pretty much irrespective of your experience, you can potentially use it. The challenge of it though, is that it's not the most deliverable balloon. And if you can't deliver it to its location, or if you can't bail out, if it doesn't work with an atherectomy based approach, then you're still going to be in trouble. So this is going to be, I think, an important adjunct to what we do, but it's most certainly not going to replace atherectomy or other techniques or tools. My view on any tool of interventional cardiovascular medicine is learn as many as you can, because that'll allow you to titrate what you use for the specific patient scenario in which you need to use it. This is just the initial data from the shockwave study. Um, uh, essentially what they found is it was safe and, um, and fracture was seen in the OCT subgroup in almost 80% of cases, but of note, pre-dilatation was needed in 42% of cases. So this is not something you're just gonna fly down, deploy, and then be done with the case. Now, what about other techniques? So rotational atherectomy, um, I'm not sure people know this, but it's been basically around since 1993 in a relatively unchanged form up until a couple of years ago. And so basically the way it works is there's a diamond coated burr. There's only diamond coating on the front, not on the back. So if you happen to slip past the lesion, you can get stuck. And that's an important aspect of why we try to go slow with rotational atherectomy comes in a variety of different burr sizes, ranging from 125 up to 20. There's actually bigger ones too. Um, and there's a like steel guide wire that has a um, stopper here so you can't go over the end um, uh, of the wire. Now this is a newer system um, where they no, more, no longer had a foot pedal. It just sort of has an activation here and all the buttons are on here. Um, it's supposed to be easier uh, to learn and use. It does take a little bit of uh, getting used to, but that's, that's the truth. It's easier to set up with the cables and that sort of thing. Um, the funny thing is that if you've been using the old system for a while and you're so used to it, everything is new and it takes some time. And so I remember a very funny joke from Paul Tierstein um, who said, you know, I love the new system. The only thing is I can't find out where to put my foot on the table. 
So um, I can't hear you laugh, so I can't tell if people are laughing, but I hope some people did laugh. Um, but basically, if you're so used to the old system, the new one can be something that you're saying, why do I need? Um, here's how it works. You're sort of going through the lesion in a pecking sort of way. You're only going to get a max diameter that is the width of the burr. So it's not orbiting, and I'll show you the picture of orbital atherectomy that's different than this. It's just making a channel, but it's modifying plaque in such a way that then if you balloon afterwards, you can then crack it and you can actually expand a little bit better. So the whole idea is plaque modification. When this technology first came out, this was almost before stents even, uh, the idea was is to take much larger burr to artery sizes, so at like this, so as to make a bigger lumen with the burr alone. Um, but overall, that's not something that needs to be done in the stent era because we're basically just using it to modify the plaque, not to generate a large lumen. You can also see that with the larger burr, all that stuff that was here has embolized downstream. And with rotational atherectomy and, and orbital um, in particular, but I think probably more with rotational than orbital, the issue of embolic debris and causing stunning of the myocardium is a real issue that has to be uh, considered when doing it. So how often is atherectomy used? Uh, not, that, not that frequently. I remember I showed you before that slide from Syntax that up to 50% of cases in Syntax had severe calcification. Well, atherectomy, at least in this analysis that we published in CERC Interventions, is only around you know, 3%, it's going up, but 3%. And among hospitals that perform PCI, a third of them perform no atherectomy at all. So there's clearly a learning curve and we feel there's underutilization of atherectomy. And that's one of the reasons why there's so many referred cases of stent under expansion. But it's not true everywhere. So in the VA, for instance, where you'd expect there to be a lot more calcium, anybody who's worked in the VA would know why that happens. You actually see atherectomy being used in 18% of single vessel PCI cases. And by the way, it was associated with a decrease in procedural and clinical complications. So some people feel that there's more complications with it, and there certainly are if you use it in the wrong way um, or use it in dangerous scenarios. But the more facile you get with it, you actually find that it makes the case move smoother and can potentially reduce the, um, the time of the case as well as potential complications as well. Um, that needs to be demonstrated in a prospective way, and that's something that's ongoing, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Now, interestingly, some people sort of say, well, what if we just sort of try with balloons and then use atherectomy when we need to? You can do that, but that was actually studied nicely in Milan, which is a very, very high complexity center. And in that analysis, if you did it up front, procedure time was less, fluoro time was less, contrast volumes were less than if you did it later. And by the way, the clinical outcomes were worse if you had to bail out to do atherectomy. And the reason is, is that if you're trying with balloons and you're flailing and flogging away and it doesn't work, and then you have to do atherectomy, there's a relative contraindication to that, although we do do it. Um, but it also means the case was a lot worse to start off with. And so some would say those are the types of cases you should just pick to do up front. So what about a randomized trial? Well, this is one trial, 2013, 240 patients, atherectomy versus balloon alone. And what was shown is that the restenosis um, in terms of late lumen loss was actually greater with atherectomy compared to balloon alone. And there's a thought that by doing the atherectomy, you injure the vessel more than if you just did balloon alone. And which is, by the way, one of the reasons why I think ultimately even a technology like Shockwave will need a trial because even though it can help your case early, it might be associated with a greater instance of restenosis. We just don't know. And so that's something that needs to be studied over time. But if you looked at the procedural outcomes, their strategy was more successful upfront if you did rota than if you just did a balloon alone. The counter, counter argument to this though is that 83% of the time, in the balloon arm, you didn't need the rota. So that's one of the things that needs to be sorted out over time. And when they substratified by severe versus moderate calcification, it was really only in the severe calcific arteries where the strategy failed with a balloon alone and rota seemed to be more successful. Now, there are some studies, a very small pilot study, randomized trial of rotational atherectomy plus a cutting balloon to see if you can get a bigger lumen area. This is at pre, this is after rota, the fracture is there. After cutting balloon, you see more expansion and the fracture is deepened. And after stenting, you see a bigger area. So this is something that some people do. It's not clear to me whether you need the cutting balloon versus you need an NC balloon um, in order to affect this change. A more recent study that was published in the last couple of years, another small study, 200 patients, scoring balloon versus rotablation uh, and treatment with drug-looting stents. 
very similar to Rotaxis, showing that the strategy success, uh, which is the primary endpoint, was better with atherectomy, almost 100%, um, but 80% of the time with the modified balloon, it worked. So those other 20% of cases, crossover had to occur. Um, but overall, you could argue that if it was you know, 80% successful, then that might be okay over the long run if you didn't do it. I, my own personal view on this, though, is that even if you can get through the case with a balloon, you likely will get a larger area with atherectomy. And that's one of the hypotheses of the eclipse trial, which I'll show you in just a little bit. Um, that's a larger randomized trial looking at this. Now, in terms of speed, this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting question that um, is, is always out there. How fast do you go on the rota? This is a, uh, an interesting study looking at uh, burst speed and showing that lower speeds were associated with more debulking, but also less bradycardia and less potential embolization. And so in general, lower speed is favored. This is just a randomized trial of low speed 140 versus high speed 190. And overall 140 was fine. And it in some ways allows you to go slower because if you go super high speed, you tend to rush a little bit and it may jump through the lesion. Sometimes some would argue it could get stuck as well. So that's enough about Rota. What about Orbital? Um, this is the Diamondback system, and basically it's all hand activated. And there's also a glide assist feature where if you hold the button down here, it will slow, it'll go at a lower rotation, which is quite useful for actually getting through vessels where you don't want to, do, to spin, but you just want to get through the vessel and it defeats friction when you do that. Now, interestingly, unlike Rota, there's no front um, front uh, sort of cutting. So you get it through the lesion, but it also rotates around the vessel and it basically will uh, ablate a greater vessel size than the diameter of the burr itself, which is 1.25. So this is just an example of that showing you that if you go relatively fast with this 1.25 burr, your lumen size is only going to get up to 1.3, 1.4 or so. But if you actually take it at high speed and you go very slowly, you can almost get up to 175 with just this 1.25 burr. And that's potentially the advantage of the orbital type of system. Um, the other thing that can happen is because it's sort of bouncing across and over the vessel, you can get pulsatility or sort of effects where it's sort of banging up against the vessel wall with calcification. The degree to which that's important in this mechanism of action is not known, but you do see that as well because it's kind of sinusoidally oscillating against both vessel walls. This was studied in the ORBIT-2 trial, which allowed FDA approval, showing that you could get the stent there in a vast majority of cases um, with low rates of in-hospital MACE as a whole, because this was largely driven by paraprocedural MI. I will mention that with any atherectomy strategy, if you look at the rates of paraprocedural enzyme elevation, it's going to be higher because of the small mi micro debris. Even if you do a SPECT study in cases early on with rotational atherectomy, you can actually see stunning of a wall and a spec defect at immediately after the procedure. But at six weeks, at two months out, that goes away as the debris is taken up by the reticular endothelial system. So in general, it's something you have to think about and worry about acutely, but the long-term sequelae seem to be less. Now with orbital atherectomy, there are also very low rates of perforation, slow flow, no reflow. My own view on this is with any atherectomy device, you have to be facile at knowing how to manage dissection and perforation, um, because if you don't, then you're using a tool without a bailout. Um, you're basically jumping without a parachute. And so that's not something that you want to be able to do what you want to do. And then late outcomes in orbit two, much of it is 30 days, but you can still see 20% rate of adverse mace uh, out to uh, three years with, um, with, with uh, a, a calcific lesion strategy. This to me is not attributable to the device per se, it's actually the fact that these patients with severe calcification tend to be sicker with late, late uh, worse adverse outcomes. So everybody always asks, what's the relative advantage of one device versus another, orbital versus rotational? So with orbital, um, there's actually two wires, a stiff wire and a floppy wire, but it's, it's uh, the setup's a little bit easier, the faster learning curve, and some of this has been overcome by the Rotopro use, but, um, but still this tended to be a general benefit of OAS. Single device for all lesions and vessels, and you can do a six French guide, including a guide extension. It will go through a guide extension that's six French, uh, just provided you load it carefully. Um, potentially less hemodynamic stability because the flush is a lot more. And then you can also get to more distal lesions uh, by using the glide assist feature to get to those lesions. But R Rota has benefits because aorta osteal, it's of choice because you don't have orbiting and you don't have the issue of a dissection. Severe angulation bias favors Rota. 
crossing in a subintimal space because it's not orbiting. It cuts in the front. So if it's truly uncrossable, then that can be an advantage. And then there are other scenarios where you need larger burrs or under expansion for stent ablation. Plus, um, uh, if you have a single device, it's less costly than using orbital. But the bottom line is either can be used in most cases of severe calcification. There are relative advantages to each. And that's why we have both. And um, I, I use some when I use to, when I use one when I, it benefits that scenario and the other one when it benefits the other scenario. Here's just an interesting case, uh, just a, a thought experiment. This is a patient with, uh, with angina that stabilized on medical therapy, comes back. I think you can appreciate the calcium in all the vessels and has this LED lesion with some calcification here and then this lesion here. And so the question is, in contemporary cath labs nowadays, aside from the fact that this wouldn't have been femoral, it would have been radial, um, what would you treat? Would you do atherectomy? Would you do a specialty balloon? Would you do an NC balloon? Would you image first? What would you do? And this is the fundamental question. Right now, I would say in cath labs around the country, there's some that would use any of these things. And that is probably not the best thing. We need to sort this out. And so this patient was actually randomized in the Eclipse trial. Um, what the Eclipse trial is, is a trial, now a, a shameless plug, I'm running. I'm the PI of the trial, the sponsor is CSI. But the idea behind a trial is not necessarily just about CSI. It's basically trying to determine in 2000 patients, if you have severe calcification, whether an atherectomy based strategy versus a conventional atherectomy based strategy makes any difference in terms of outcomes. And the outcomes we're looking at are the stent area by OCT and then also one year target vessel failure as well as procedural success, cost, et cetera. So we think scientifically this is an important question because we just don't know and many cath labs do a lot of different things. This patient was randomized in Eclipse. I'm not gonna tell you what arm the patient was in. This was the final angiogram, which looks pretty acceptable at first. And then if you look down here, there still is a residual waste in that one area that was the tightest area of the stent. This is the final OCT. And I'll show you, I'll jump to here. This is where you see stent expansion. And then you'll see some eccentricity and this waste here with a minimal lumen area of 4.2. So the question in the trial is, is that good enough? Is that gonna be fine? Is the patient gonna do well? Or is that patient gonna come back with an adverse event later? And the randomization helps us to really sort that out. So that's predominantly it for the data. I'll show you a few cases and then we can take some questions at the end. Um, and these cases will illustrate other devices and ways we think through cases. So this is an RCA CTO, uh, patient came in symptomatic. It looks perhaps a little bit thrombotic, but it turns out it's probably a combination of thrombus and heavy, heavy calcification, which you can appreciate. Um, this is shots from the contralateral side where you can see the collaterals and it fills and then there's a severe calcification in the mid right coronary artery. So this is a case where, you know, we have dual injections, we come prepared and what happens actually is with setup of a microcatheter, the wire, a hydrophilic wire crosses actually without too much difficulty. And what we've done here is we've taken an injection from the opposite side to confirm that we're truly in the lumen, advance the wire, and we're there. And I remember the fellow saying to me, oh, we're great. We're almost done with the case. So should we call for the next patient? Sometimes, especially with severe calcification, when you cross like this, that's when the case actually has begun because now you have to be able to get all your equipment through there and expand. And so in this particular case, even with the wire down, with a trap liner down to here, nothing is basically crossing. And so this is eight French, we have an eight French trap liner down. And because we decided that you know money was free that day, we tried a 3-0 balloon proximal, we took a turnpike spiral microcatheter, an LP, a mamba, a smaller balloon, a gold, a 125 balloon, a Corsair Pro, a Mamba Flex. Now, some of these, by the way, they were trying out so we could use them for free because we obviously don't want to run up the bill like this, but nothing would cross. So what next? What do you do at that point? You have a wire down, but no microcatheter or balloon will cross. So <clears throat> that's actually a good use for laser. Um, the other alternatives are in their money. You can pull the wire and put a roto wire and all that stuff, but if you want your wire to stay, you can use something called laser atherectomy. And so the three potential uses for laser are balloon uncrossable lesions, where a wire across is nothing else crosses, which is what this is. If you have instant restenosis due to stent under expansion um, or severe thrombus and ACS. So the way laser works is there's thermal heat, there's chemical breakage of bonds, and there's a mechanical effect. And predominantly we're using the mechanical effect to our advantage. Now when the laser's on, most people don't recognize this, but there's actually only on 
for a short percentage of time. Even at the highest uh, hertz that we use, 80, um, it's only on 4% of the time and it's resting for 96% of the time. So that's something people don't necessarily recognize. The effect that's photochemical and thermal is just directionally, longitudinally from the laser tip, but this photomechanical effect is not just forward, but it's also to the sides. And that's one of the reasons why laser can be dangerous because it can damage the vessel, not just in the forward plane, but also uh, sideways. In the early days, when before we had stents, laser was used as a sole mechanism for balloon angioplasty, and it actually caused major dissections and other problems. And this is determined not only by the energy you put in, but also the absorbance of the tissue and medium, where saline tends to have the less, least effect, plaque has a little bit more, and blood has the most. Um, so in terms of, uh, of, of how this works, I'll show you these pictures. This is the first setting. We, when we say laser, we usually give settings like 80, 80, 60, 40, whatever. The first setting is, uh, is the fluence and how much energy is being put in. So you can see the bubble is much bigger at 60 than 20. And then this is what that mechanical effect is. This is an ice cube. And basically as the laser activates, it causes a bubble that bursts and shatters the ice cube. That's kind of how it works. This is what it looks like in contrast. And this is what it looks like in saline. So you can see how much more um, uh, unpredictable it is in contrast in saline. And that's one of the reasons why typically you're only gonna do laser with a saline flush, not so much a contrast flush. How do you do it? Well, basically you don't exceed two thirds of the vessel diameter. You use saline as a flush and you go slowly so that you don't cause major, major issues. And so in this case, we took a 0.9 laser, 80-80, and the laser catheter crossed through this while we were able to maintain wire position. So that's actually a great scenario. So how do you do it? Well, you wanna maximize the tissue ablation, minimize photomechanical effects for these types of cases. So you're not using contrast, you're using heparinized saline, you're advancing the catheter slowly, and you sort of move the wire a little bit because if the wire stays fixed and you're on that laser site too long, you can actually melt the, the wire and that you don't wanna do. So you're, you're sort of moving the wire back and forth a little bit. Once that happened, able to get a microcatheter down. So to see the microcatheter now crosses and spins into the distal vessel. And then we start going up with NC balloons, which still won't expand. So what we've done is we've created a channel with the laser, but now, nothing is expanding. So what do you do in this case? And by the way, eight French with a trap liner down here. It's not about crossing, it's about expanding because we don't want to put in an underexpanded stent. So now we have to use a different technology because the laser only makes so big a, big a hole, we, we, we now want to expand it better. And so in this case, we used an atherectomy-based approach to basically cause a fracture. And after atherectomy, that's what you see. And we did IVIS and their fracture planes here. And then ultimately after stenting, this is, uh, I'll show you the final picture um, after I show you the IVIS. IVIS gets a huge luminary of 11. And then this is the final angiogram after the stents are in where you can see everything is expanded. And there's nice antegrade flow. So what do we do? We use the laser to create the channel because nothing would cross. And then we had to do another atherectomy device to be able to expand the stent. So it's not just about delivery, it's about expansion as well. So here's back to that initial case I showed you. This is that underexpanded stent in the proximal LED. The vessel is open, but literally nothing crosses. IVIS doesn't cross, the NC Quantum, the NC Euphora, it doesn't matter which company it is, nothing is expanding, even though the balloon crosses. So what do you do next? Well, what we did is we exchanged for something called a wiggle wire. This is a wire that is um, somewhat supportive because of the fact that it's, it's sort of um, like a Z and it sort of anchors itself in the vessel and we tried to expand with an angus belt and that didn't work. So ultimately what we did is we did laser atherectomy with contrast. So we put the laser catheter in the stent, injected contrast as we turned on the laser, which is totally off label, but we were able to then expand and this is an NC balloon at 3.0 that expands. One thing that's very important to mention is after you do atherectomy or any plaque modification strategy, what you have to do before you put the stent in is you go up with an NC balloon to make sure you have had those fractures and you've actually cracked the calcium and it will expand. Because if it doesn't, then you may have to go with a bigger burr or do something else. But in this case, you can see it expanded. Interestingly, despite the fact that it expanded, the stent, we went up with 3.5, the stent still wouldn't deliver because you can see it goes up, down, and there's an edge of a stent here. And so what we did is we, you see the wiggles, the Zs and the wire, we were able to use this to our advantage. And so I pulled the wiggle wire back, you'll see it come back, and then the stent, expand, stent goes in because it doesn't hit the upper portion of this, this vessel here, which was causing the issue. So with that, we then put the new stent in, 
And this was the final result, which you can appreciate is finally expanded and did very well. This is what the IVAs look like um, with an area of 7.9. The last case I'll show you before we can go to some questions is another case illustrating the value of imaging. So 69 year old gentleman, multiple risk factors, had exertional angina, but no rest symptoms and came in, um, the pro BNP was a little bit elevated, the troponin mildly positive and stable. Um, this is what the EKG looked like, not a lot of anterior forces here. Um, and the echo showed an EF of 20 to 25% with anterior anterocephal apical akinesis, but no thrombus and the remaining walls were variably hypokinetic. So he came to the cath lab um, and luckily he had the echo first, which was helpful. And because the EF is down, we did a right heart catheterization. And that's something we do frequently in our cath lab because we wanna understand the hemodynamics of the patient in addition to what the arteries are. And if you remember as an interventional fellow, the history of cardiac cath started with hemodynamics. Angiography was an accident and it came later. Now, most fellows are solely fixated on PCI, but the reality is, is to be a good doc and a good cath doc, you need to know hemodynamics and understand them because we make patients sicker when we're doing interventions and we need to understand how that can happen. So here are the hemodynamics, the AO pressure is low, the index is somewhat preserved, and this is the angiogram. So flush occlusion of this osteo LED, a lot of calcium here, that's presumably that infarct, the circ is kind of small. There's some diminutive disease in the OM there. Um, here's just more of the LED. Really no LED to speak of, no collateral even really, maybe some faint stuff over here. And this is the right, which is an enormous vessel. And basically is the, most of the heart with collaterals to this, this septal area. And there's severe, severe calcification and this nasty looking nodule as well. So the question is, what do you do next? Do you do this ad hoc? How do you sort it out and figure it out? Well, I think one of the things we wanted to do is figure out if there's viability in the LED. And the reason for it is if there was viability in the LED, then this might be a stitch trial type of patient who would be benefiting from surgery. Remember, severe calcification is associated with bad outcomes when we do PCI. It's associated with bad outcomes with surgery too, but surgical um, therapy is always an option for these patients. And because the patient was stable, we had time to be able to sort this out. With no viability in the LED, surgery is not a good option for this patient because that's where your benefit's gonna be of Lima and other walls are very, uh, viable. So we opted to do PCI, but we were very concerned that with doing atherectomy on this, um, the patient, if he has slow flow in the right, he's basically not gonna make it. He has very little reserve. So the idea was is to potentially do this with hemodynamic support. So actually in this case, um, we didn't do it with single access. We could have done single access, but got radial um, in the right. And then with a multi-purpose, we were able to visualize where we were going and did ultrasound guided access of the common femoral. And we put in a swan again. Now, the reason we put in the swan again is to watch the hemodynamics during the case, because when you start hemodynamic support, and I know Sandeep is gonna talk about this next, so I won't go to it in detail. What happens is, is you can unload the left side of the heart and if the patient gets hypotensive, you may need to give fluid boluses or do other things. So we keep the right heart cap in during that time. It was a little bit challenging to get in because um, of the fact that there's some tortuosity here. And actually with single axis, it might've been a challenge because I wanted to use an AL guide to come prepared for the atherectomy. So here's our AL, the impella is in position, and now we're ready to, to go ahead and work. So I wired this with a workhorse wire. Actually, the, work, the wire was not that hard. Exchanged with a microcatheter for the atherectomy wire. And <clears throat> this is atherectomy. And interestingly, when you do atherectomy, it's not just feel, it's a sound. And you're listening for the abrasion of the plaque by the atherectomy device. And interesting, as we were doing the case, I remember saying, look, you know, there's not actually a lot of sound here. And by the way, at the start of the case, before we went in, I took a survey of attendings in our lab and I said, what do you guys think this is? Is this calcium or thrombus? And it was sort of 90 to 10 calcium because there is calcium in the vessel uh, versus thrombus. But remember the patient presented with low level troponins and had other things. And after atherectomy, it kind of looks not too different. And we didn't really hear much of a sound with atherectomy. So here's the OCT, which basically shows deep wall calcification and thrombus in the vessel. So what this case was all along was deep wall calcification, but thrombus inside the vessel. So 
if we had done imaging from the start, we might not have done atherectomy. We might have just done thrombectomy or just done a regular PCI. I still think we would use hemodynamic support because the thrombus can embolize, but it would have changed what we did. And that's why I show you the case. So basically we did thrombectomy. After thrombectomy, it looks a little bit better. We then took an NC balloon. Remember, you're still taking balloons because there is calcium in the wall. There's deep calcium in the wall. Um, NCs with 3O and finally after a 4-5 DES with post dill, this is what the final OCT looks like, which is an enormous vessel with good expansion, a little bit um, eccentric over here, and this was the final angiogram. So case went successful. And then <clears throat> as far as the hemodynamics, you can see the right heart cath gets a little bit worse because the patient gets sicker during the case. The index drops, but we felt that it was sufficient with a PA status 62 to explant. And because we had the access from above, we did dry closure basically um, and took a picture from above showing that we were sealed. So we did the case safely. So in conclusion, because I know we just have a little bit of time left for questions, I think hopefully you could get the sense from this talk that number one, coronary calcification is becoming more and more prevalent in the modern day cath lab and in the CHIP era. That aging population, many more comorbidities, downstream presentations, and by comorbidities, I mean things like diabetes, end stage renal disease, smoking, things that predispose to calcification. Calcification uh, uh, lesions are among the highest risk lesions we treat, and they cause us for sure short term pain and suffering and risk during the procedure but also impact longer term outcomes. And that's not something that I think a lot of fellows uh, appreciate going, going into things. I certainly did. Imaging is a must. And I can't emphasize on you, uh, to you how much imaging is a must. You can diagnose the calcium. It will change your treatment algorithm. That last case is an example of it. Um, but even other ones, it may change you a change and you think you're gonna do atherectomy and you end up doing NC balloons. That's benefit for the patient. You've saved money too by doing something like that. After lesion preparation prior to stent implantation, we often go back, the catheter is already open, just to make sure we have the fracture planes and that we've expanded. And then finally, at the very end, to optimize the stent. Because these lesions have the highest risk of restenosis, you wanna make sure you do the best job you can, and the best job you can is impacted by an imaging run. And just note that the field of adjunctive therapies for calcific lesions is heating up with more and more data emerging soon. I mentioned to you that the shockwave data, the US approval trial will likely be presented at TCT in a couple months. And similarly, Eclipse continues to enroll and we're hoping to be able to present that in a couple of years. So with that, I just wanna thank you for listening. Um, for those of you, I know it's been tough times for everybody and um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, from, my family's from India and I just wanted to show you, um, it's, it's Ganesh Chaturthi today, which is sort of the day celebrating Sri uh, Ganesha, who is basically the remover of all obstacles. We in 2020 most certainly need a lot of obstacles to be removed. This is the Ganesha that's in my family's house that was brought from India. And so um, irrespective of your religion, I hope that um, good things are for us and that obstacles are removed coming forward. Thanks so much for having me for this presentation. Thanks, Ajay. That was a great talk. Um, and to people who don't know, um, Ajay is a great operator. I learned a lot of these little tips and tricks when I worked with him in Columbia. So um, that was wonderful. So let me start off with the first question, Ajay, regarding your last case. Can you comment on um, pacemaker TVP versus aminophilin for your, you did a right atherectomy, right? Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. So for that case in particular, because we had the impella in, I was a little bit less concerned about um, uh, about uh, putting a putting a pacer, and I can't remember if I put it in or not, but I don't think I did. Um, obviously, there's you know if you have a choice between a pacemaker and an impella, put the pacemaker <laughs> because it's less it's a venous access, etc. But there's some physicians who say they never have to use it, um, but there are definitely cases with long runs where you will need to you, where you'll see bradycardia. So. Aminophilin is something you can give um, preemptively or prophylactically, um, and there was a shortage for a while, so that's something that, um, that we haven't done for a while, but that's one way to mitigate it. And I know labs where they really say that they almost never had to use a pacer because they're using aminophilin up front. The other issue that comes up is ROTA versus CSI. Um, anecdotally, there's perhaps some data that suggests that there's less uh, slow flow and bradycardia with CSI compared to rota. We don't know if it's it's the fact that you're maintaining flow because the burr is smaller. You don't know if it's because the flush rate is a lot faster. Uh, we don't know if it's just, you know, folklore. 
So there are some studies looking at it. Uh, Ziad in, in our lab, uh, Ziad Ali, um, has a small randomized trial looking at microvascular dysfunction. So there'll be some data coming out with regards to that as well. And Eclipse will certainly uh, shed some light too. But I would basically say for a new fellow going into practice, um, err on the side of caution. So it's much worse for you to do a rota case and the patient gets bradyacystolic and arrests and ends up intubated than it is to safely put in a pacemaker at the beginning of the case before you've given heparin and leave it in and feel more comfortable. That's great. Um, do you prefer rota for osteal lesions? And what's your opinion on rota slash CSI for resistant instant restenosis? Yeah, so two, two questions. So osteal lesions, typically speaking, you have to be very careful with CSI because the orbit, can, you can see me too, right? Yeah, so the orbit goes like this. And so you'll go from a big, big aortic thing into a smaller thing. And if it's non-coaxial, that's where you can get a dissection. By the way, Rhoda as well, if you take a guide where you're coming from above and it's non-coaxial, you can also dissect too. But because you're not orbiting, there's pro probably less risk of that. So that's why I would say um, osteal would favor Rhoda. You can do osteal lesions that are not super, super tight with CSI. And what you do is you basically get into the vessel first and you only do the atherectomy on the way back. And the CSI has the advantage because you can cut on the way back or a blade on the way back as well. So that's, that's if you're gonna do it, you could do it that way. But in general, for a tight osteal lesion, you want a coaxial rota. Now, as far as ISR goes, remember the treatment of choice for ISR first is to diagnose what's going on. If it's neointimal hyperplasia, and that's how you can tell by IVUS or OCT, then you don't need to do any atherectomy. You basically just um, you know, treat with another drug, either a DCB, which, which they have in Europe, or here, DES. But if there is under expansion, um, then typically the algorithm is going to be NC balloons high first. Then we, before we had shockwave, we would probably use um, uh, uh, laser with contrast and then atherectomy. And in general, we were favoring Rhoda over CSI especially for fresher stents. But more recently, we've been using CSI for some late stent under expansion cases that have gotten pretty reasonable results because it also orbits. Um, but you just have to be careful and all those things are super, super off label. Um, what we have done now though, is we've been starting to use the shockwave peripheral balloon in these scenarios first, because we just feel like it's probably safer than doing any of those other approaches. Great. Um, there's a question. Um, is there a cutoff of how soon after stenting atherectomy can be done? Uh, would you prefer rota or uh, CSI in that scenario? Yeah, there's not really a cutoff. In fact, we have in our lab for cases that are unfortunate where the stent was implanted freshly um, and um, still under expanded, we've done rota in the same setting as the original PCI of the stent. I'm not advocating it. It was not fun, but you can do it. In that case, I would favor road over CSI. Um, otherwise, though, I, I think it, it, it's got to be a few months out before you start feeling um, probably comfortable with the CSI device. And um, I would, you know, arbitrarily say, you know, four or five months, something like that. But it's completely, you know, I, I have no data upon which to base that, um, that assertion. Anytime you're putting an atherectomy device through an old stent, whether it's really old or fresh, the risk is a lot higher. And so you just have to be really, really careful. It can get stuck. It can mangle the stent. There are a whole bunch of bad things that can happen. So would you prefer a uh, laser in those situations? Uh, potentially, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. Actually, what I, as I said before, what we've been doing is using the peripheral shockwave balloon totally off label because that tends to be okay. One thing though to remember is that if you have a fresh stent and you use the shockwave balloon, um, you, um, you can actually mess with the integrity of the stent platform and the polymer. So actually um, the shockwave folks themselves will tell you that that's not something you wanna do with a relatively fresh stent. And again, what, the, what does fresh mean arbitrarily three, four months, something like that. Could you comment a little bit about uh, the term wire bias? Yeah. So wire bias is basically the, the concept of where the wire sits within the vessel. And most of the time we like to think that the wire sits smack in the middle of the vessel. So I don't know if you can see my hands, but it's right in the middle. But the thing is, is that if there's a bend in the vessel, the wire is going to ride along um, the, the uh, greater curvature of the vessel. And so that wire is biased in the direction of the greater curvature. 
What that means is that devices that we take along the wire, now there's also a device wire interaction, but let's say it just stays along where the wire is, the device is gonna ride on the greater curvature too. So if that happens, especially with an atherectomy device, that's how you get, it doesn't touch the other wall and it only touches the wall where the wire is. By the way, that's also one of the reasons why imaging can be really useful because the imaging catheter will ride along the same bias as your atherectomy device. So if you go with the imaging catheter and what you find is the wire is against the side that has no calcium at all and the calcium is opposite the side of the wire, well, if you take a rotaburr, it's not gonna ablate the calcium and it may ablate where the wire is. So the issue of wire bias really relates to where the wire sits in the vessel and you can use it to your advantage or your disadvantage based upon how it's situated as long as you recognize what's going on. Um, regarding the rotor size of the burr, how do you how do you choose or how do you pick the size of the burr? Now, almost always for de novo lesions, you're going to take pick a um, one five, or if it's a small lesion, a one two five, and all you're trying to do is modify plaque to be able to expand. Um, there are rare cases where you'll take a one seven five, or if you're doing stent ablation, one seven five or two zero. But in general, it's going to be one five, sometimes one two five, but the one two five is a little bit more. Um, elliptical and can get stuck. So you just have to be careful and go slow. And the last question is, um, could you tell us about the contrast laser? How do you do that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically it's only for stent under expansion. And um, what you would do first is you try with saline first. And if it doesn't then expand, and then you have to go back with a balloon to see if it expands, then you basically inject little puffs as well as you're, um, as you're uh, activating the laser. But you have to only do that inside a stent. If you do it outside a stent, you're gonna have a massive dissection and causing issues. And you have to be very, very careful for bubbles and, air, and sort of this vapor embolization and patients getting sick during it. So just be very careful with it. Um, the other thing too, real quick, real, just last thing is laser for neointimal hyperplasia. There's data in the periphery that it works in the SFA, but in the coronary, it, it, there's no good data. There's some people who swear by using laser every case of instant restenosis. The reality is, is that it's not, um, it, it's not something that, uh, that, uh, that has necessarily been proven yet. That's awesome. Thank you so much for today's talk. Please join us back at 12 o'clock if we're able to, um, and uh, Dr. Ashwati. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you very much, Ajay. And, uh, you know, that's that's excellent, awesome talk, very informative. I think everybody really loved it. A lot of positive comments already on the on the chat. Uh, I'm going to just uh, um, uh, ask pass one more question over. I think this uh, this attendee has asked it twice. Is there a cutoff of how soon after stenting atherectomy can be done? Also, is RA preferred over OAS in that scenario? We actually, we actually answered it. I was looking at the chat too, so we're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. So uh, again, you know, we will have the chat at 12 noon, and if you're able to join us, that would be great. We really appreciate, uh, you know, all your commitment. Yeah, I, I'm unfortunately I won't be able to make it at noon because of the family activities for Ganesha Thurthi, but thanks everybody, and uh, and I'm sure Poonam and everybody will lead a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, and happy Ganesha Chaturthi to you and your family too. Thanks, take care. Uh, thank you, Sandeep, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Nathan is our next speaker. He is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago Research School of Medicine and is full-time faculty at the University of Chicago Medical Center, where he also serves as the Medical Director of the CICU, co-director of the Cardiac Cat Lab, and Director of the Interventional Cardiology Fellowship Program. Uh, Dr. Nathan earned his uh, undergraduate degree from Boston University, his medical degree from Boston University School of Medicine, and completed his internal medicine residency training at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He completed his fellowship in cardiology at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, where he also served as the chief cardiology fellow and subsequently received training in cardiology and peripheral vascular intervention. Following his subspecialty fellowship training in interventional cardiology, he earned a master of science degree in clinical research through an NIH K30 funded program administered by the Rush Graduate College with a focus on clinical trial design. He's a fellow of the ACC, the SKY. He currently serves as an investigator for a number of sponsored, in, investigated, initiated, and NIH-funded studies and registries. He has co-authored over 100 original manuscripts, a review articles, scientific communications, and textbook chapters in the areas of acute coronary syndromes, a platelet inhibition, percutaneous coronary intervention, cardiogenic shock, and mechanical circulatory support. 
His clinical practice is centered on complex coronary intervention, transradial angiography and interventions, cardiogenic shock and mechanical support, circulatory support in complex PCI and heart failure and structural heart interventions with a focus on transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Sandeep has spent a ton of time in Chicago, almost his whole uh, cardiology career over there. So, and he has a lot of expertise in this area. He's going to be talking to us about hemodynamic support devices. Thank you, Sandeep. Mahi, thank you so much. Thanks, Poonam. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to uh, present. Um, can you guys see my screen okay? Yes. Yes, we are seeing it, yeah. Okay, terrific. Uh, okay, great. So <clears throat> I hope uh, Ajay got everybody warmed up. Everyone's adequately caffeinated. We've got a ton of good, uh, good material to cover. Um, and so in the next 45 minutes or so, I'll talk about percutaneous mechanical circulatory support and try to touch upon uh, all of the available devices and some of the data that everyone should be familiar with uh, from the interventional cardiology perspective. I have the following disclosures to share with you. I've served as a consultant for a number of companies uh, that are invested in the uh, mechanical circulatory support space, but I'll try to uh, present this in as balanced a fashion as possible. So first, normal and abnormal hemodynamics, I think is a, a really important foundational point that I'd like to make. Uh, the four phases of the cardiac cycle are shown here, divided by uh, right atrial and right ventricular uh, hemodynamic um, and uh, left atrial and left ventricular hemodynamics. The four phases, of course, are isovolumic contraction, ejection, isovolumic relaxation, and diastolic filling. The way it looks, uh, in a uh, LV pressure volume loop is, uh, is as follows. As you can see here, the four phases with the opening and closure of the various left-sided valves are shown here, point A signifying, um, uh, uh, as you can see, mitral valve closure, uh, point B, aortic valve uh, opening, C, uh, aortic valve closure, and point D, mitral valve uh, opening. Um, now, a few other parameters that are associated with the PBL that uh, everyone should be familiar with is the end systolic pressure volume relationship mapped out in green and the end diastolic pressure volume relationship mapped out in, uh, in blue. This becomes important because uh, the downward shift in the end systolic pressure volume relationship signifies the loss of myocardial contractility and the characteristic downward and rightward shift in the, uh, in the pressure volume loop is characteristic of acute cardiogenic shock. Um, the, the fingerprint, if you will, of uh, acute or acute on chronic heart failure looks slightly different, but acute loss of contractility uh, looks like this in terms of the downward shift in end systolic pressure volume relationship. You're probably wondering why am I belaboring this point uh, about the ESPVR. It becomes important when we think about how we regain pressure and flow with different mechanical circulatory support devices. So more to follow there. Um, let's shift gears now and talk about the uh, actual characterization of cardiogenic shock in the patient and who's eligible for mechanical circulatory support. Broadly divided, the two areas where we might want to use mechanical circulatory support are uh, cardiogenic shock uh, and uh, high-risk PCI or high-risk interventions in general. I'll, I'll share with you what that means. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, early recognition is the key to intervention, but the problem is that uh, people end up on different lines, as you can see here, different trajectories uh, may often pr uh, present with different types of uh, clinical characteristics. Uh, early signs are often missed. Compensatory signs are acknowledged, but perhaps not acted upon. Progressive signs are usually when uh, the fire department gets involved, and then refractory signs are often when the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cath lab gets called. Uh, to put in mechanical circulatory support. And so I think the key to success from a clinical perspective is to recognize some of these signs early on. And some of the clinical and classic definitions are shown here. Sustained systolic blood pressure less than 90, cardiac index less than 2.2, and an elevated wedge. More recently, meaning over the past 10 years or so, newer observations and hemodynamic metrics of value have come to the fore. The cardiac power output and the pulmonary uh, artery pulsatility index, or PAPI, um, are recognized now as very strong predictors for in-hospital mortality in patients with LV versus RV versus BIV uh, shock or, uh, or failure. And so calculation of these hemodynamic parameters, of course, implies that patients should be getting hemodynamic measurements uh, before uh, the decision is made to put in mechanical circulatory support. And that's often uh, an overlooked piece of this. <laughs> 
some additional uh, risk stratification, oops, sorry, some additional risk stratification data that comes to us uh, from IBP shock two include uh, increased age, increased lactate, increased serum creatinine and glucose, history of a prior stroke, and to me, uh, flow less than three post PCI. And as you stratify patients based on these different parameters, you find that there are many different subgroups that are encompassed by the IABP shock 2 population. And we'll uh, touch upon that um, in just a few slides. 2019, I think, was a very important year for us, not just as general cardiologists and ICU cardiologists, but also as uh, interventional cardiologists, in as much as 2019 signified the arrival of the SCAI consensus statement on the classification of cardiogenic shock and really allowed us to sort of um, you know, map out shock in a more objective fashion. Uh, the classes of shock from at risk to extremis uh, A through E are shown here with the sub A modifier for patients who've suffered cardiac arrest. And so now this becomes the new language of shock as we're trying to decide who gets mechanical circulatory support and what type of support. Just a word about uh, RV failure and RV shock, because uh, often uh, this is an insidious process that's under-recognized or completely unrecognized uh, as we focus on the failing LV. We recognize that RV failure results from a variety of different processes, rarely seen in isolation outside of pure RV infarction, but it's being uh, increasingly recognized as a contributing factor for tending poorer outcomes and clearly less studied than LV failure. Some of the components of uh, medical illness that contribute to RV shock are shown here. Unfortunately, uh, this is part and parcel of almost every intubated patient in the medical intensive care unit and some patients in the cardiac intensive care unit as well. So there's a lot of different ways you can arrive at RV dysfunction. I think all too often though, we think about these in isolation or in little silos uh, as is it LV shock or is it RV shock? But it really begs the question, is it really that distinct? Or are we talking about bivy shock? This is some seminal work by Naveen Kapoor and colleagues published some years ago from the, uh, from the shock registry uh, in patients who had SWANS uh, PA catheters going into their uh, shock state and their, uh, uh, their uh, the course in the cath lab. Um, and in fact, all of these patients were clinically char characterized as LV shock patients. They came in with an acute ischemic insult uh, with LV dysfunction and uh, pulmonary uh, congestion and so forth. But in fact, if you look at the scatter plot of patients who have bi V uh, shock and fluid overload, uh, the top right quadrant, a significant proportion of those patients who actually came in as LV shock as a clinical diagnosis, in fact, have bi V shock. And so there is a significant overlap of these two different diagnoses. And I think it's important to recognize that uh, when we assess the, uh, the candidacy and appropriateness of different types of uh, mechanical circulatory support devices. Um, I think the last thing that I'll leave you with here uh, under cardiogenic shock is that it's really critical to understand that uh, what starts off as a pure hemodynamic problem vis-a-vis -vis, uh, low blood pressure, low cardiac output, often becomes a cardiometabolic syndrome as you progress from myocardial ischemia to hemodynamic instability to volume overload and systemic hypoperfusion, coronary malperfusion, and end organ dysfunction. And putting in a balloon pump when somebody's already reached the point of coronary, uh, excuse me, end organ dysfunction is a, is a little bit silly. It's, it's sort of doomed to failure at that point. Devices in combination versus surgical uh, support may be the only thing that gets that patient through to the next phase of their, uh, of their therapy. Some of the clinical uh, syndromes and uh, features are shown on the right side of this slide. So what are the currently available hemodynamic support devices? When we think about the features of an ideal percutaneous mechanical circulatory support device, we think of the following. It should provide active unloading of the failing ventricle or ventricles. It should provide consistent and high degree of circulatory support. It should be ideally rapidly implantable with low rates of complication. Uh, robust and contemporary clinical data is always appreciated. And uh, ideally, it should be comparatively superior to other devices. The bar is set pretty high, and we've only accomplished some of these things in the current sweep of the available data that we have. There are three additional issues that really uh, uh, play into this decision of uh, what de uh, device to use and when to use it, uh, the degree of support that's desired, the duration of support that's anticipated, and timing and location of initiation. Here are the devices that are currently available in the United States. Uh, four different categories of devices, aortic counterpulsation devices. Right now, all we have is intraaortic balloon pumps. There are other counterpulsation devices that are in clinical development. Um, early to use and low cost and widely available are the, the key uh, advantages. But 
uh, we recognize that there's only fractional cardiac uh, output augmentation and no direct LV uh, unloading, but at the end of the day, it's cheap and uh, associated with a low risk of complications, uh, albeit without a lot of robust data, and we'll get into that. Um, what about tandem heart? LA to uh, uh, FA uh, or aortic circuit is the, the classic uh, LV unloading scheme uh, with a high degree of support, especially with the, uh, the iterative changes to the devices that have happened in the last year or so. Uh, but there is uh, increase in afterload because you're pumping against the flow of blood. There are some technical challenges and LA cannula stability is always a concern. Uh, RA to aortic uh, or FA uh, circuit vis-a-vis uh, Percutaneous ECMO with uh, oxygenation provides a very high degree of support, but it also dramatically increases afterload. Uh, and then uh, transaortic axial pumps, uh, axial flow pumps such as Impella, uh, provide direct LV unloading and graded LV support, but there are some hemolysis and vascular access issues. Um, I'll uh, drill down on each one of these, but I want you to just sort of uh, take a mental snapshot of this. This is what the different types of uh, mechanical circulatory uh, support strategies get you in terms of a shift in the pressure volume loop. The, uh, the starting loop is shown in red. Uh, what you accomplish with, um, you know, with the different devices is shown in green. And uh, just, just take a quick look at this. I mean, there are vast differences in what you're doing to uh, LV wall stress, LV work, LV unloading, and so forth. Ultimately, however, uh, it often comes down to this, right? The, the question of right versus right now, when you're initially selecting a mechanical circulatory support device, uh, in our heart of hearts, uh, you kind of know what is the right thing to do, but often that's not even possible at your institution or uh, within the, the constraints of the patient's uh, clinical presentation. And so often the choice is made to put in something right now and then upgrade later. So balloon pump in a perfect world, let's go through each one of these uh, systematically. Balloon pump in a for, uh, perfect world, one would point out that it's low cost and familiar to everyone. It's uh, available the world over, uh, by far the most commonly implanted uh, support device the world over with ease of placement, uh, including uh, placement at the bedside, at the, you know, uh, in the cath lab with or without fluoro in a procedure suite and so forth. Low risk of bleeding and vascular complications, minimal or no anticoagulation necessary. Uh, and perhaps there's some perfusion through disease coronary arteries and a high level of augmentation is possible in a subset of patients. Ideally, it would look something like this, where we can't inject hard enough to offset the displacement of uh, non-contrasted uh, blood uh, in the left main. Um, but unfortunately, you get very little impact on stroke volume and, and diastolic volume. As you can see here, the leftward shift in the pressure volume loop is really pretty modest uh, and is variable from patient to patient. These are admittedly um, uh, simulated models uh, via Harvey. Uh, this is some of the very important work of Dan Burkhoff and others um, that show that uh, the best case scenario is about a 10% augmentation, maybe a little bit more than that in your native cardiac output. And that's assuming that you've got uh, very good uh, uh, early diastolic augmentation and uh, late uh, decrease in uh, diastolic blood pressure. Um, in the real world, this is what the, the data looks like. And I think for board's purposes, you should be familiar with this. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis of balloon pumps uh, in uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction. Seven RCTs of STEMI without shock, nine cohort studies of STEMI with uh, cardiogenic shock. And what we can say is that Without shock, there's no survival benefit, no improvement in LV function, uh, and uh, a modest increase in stroke and bleeding. Um, but with shock, there is not only no benefit in primary PCI, there may actually be an increase in mortality, um, and all the benefit is really concentrated in patients receiving fibrinolysis in the context of STEMI, not really contemporary practice. Um, the counterbalance to that uh, paper uh, is uh, the observations from BESIS-1, uh, which is admittedly a standalone study and has not been replicated in uh, large scale that randomized patients undergoing high-risk uh, elective PCI to balloon pumps versus standard of care using this uh, BESIS Jeopardy score uh, and a primary and secondary endpoints are, that are shown on this slide. Um, at the end of the day, at uh, six months, the primary endpoint, there was no difference, no statistically significant difference in favor of uh, balloon pump therapy. But an interesting thing happened when the investigators continued the follow-up for about five years. You saw this continued separation of curves in favor of intraaortic balloon pumps. Um, and what you actually see uh, when you look at the time-varying hazard ratios in BSIS-1 is that the confidence intervals remain 
become tighter and tighter while the point estimate remains right at where it is around 0.66. So at the end of uh, a little over uh, three and a half years of follow-up uh, mean, uh, there is a statistically significant uh, benefit of balloon pumps and high-risk intervention. The problem, of course, is that the mode of death and the putative mechanism of benefit are really unclear. Uh, it's unclear why, why those confidence intervals cleaned up over uh, three and a half years. So this really becomes hypothesis generating. It is not data that we can sort of hang our hat on, unfortunately. IABP shock two, I think everyone is familiar with, uh, with this trial. This was a, a, a commendable effort by uh, Holger Thiele and colleagues uh, in Europe uh, to randomize 600 patients with really uh, profound cardiogenic shock to balloon pumps versus standard of care. Uh, finding that at 30 days, there was no difference in 30-day mortality in patients that were supported with balloon pumps. Um, however, um, uh, one may argue that uh, perhaps these uh, patients were too sick to benefit really from the vast majority of circulatory support uh, therapies. Over 40% of these patients had arrested before they made it to the cath lab. 80 plus percent of these balloon pumps were implanted after the PCI was already complete. And digging further into this data, you wonder if uh, it was a question of uh, different cohorts of patients that were all under the umbrella of shock. Were they not sick enough, too sick, or just right? Uh, this is the IABP shock 2 uh, risk score that found that if you stratify these patients, as I said earlier, on the basis of age and cardiometabolic parameters, what you found is that there were three completely separate trajectories. This is a post hoc analysis, again, for hypothesis generation, but I think important data to be aware of. Uh, especially since it was validated in an external uh, cohort, the CARD shock trial validated this uh, scoring schema and found that once again, there is the same stratification of curves. And so you wonder whether there is a subpopulation that may have benefited, but you have to take the totality of data. In 600 patients with profound cardiogenic shock, no benefit of balloon pumps. Um, these and other data have driven down the use of balloon pumps, as you can see here from the nationwide inpatient sample uh, database query from uh, uh, 2005 to 2014. You see this downward trend in the use of intraortic balloon pumps, upward trend in Impella and uh, ECMO usage. This was uh, externally uh, uh, confirmed, uh, confirmed in another uh, data set, Premier uh, Healthcare Database. This is Amit the Means publication from, uh, from last year showing that uh, balloon pump usage was going down and Impella usage was, uh, was going up. But there have been some iterative changes to balloon pump therapy to counter pulsation. Uh, the most important one being the larger displacement 50cc balloon pump has not been validated as being uh, clinically more efficacious in a large scale uh, uh, trial, clinical trial. However, Dave Barron and colleagues published this in uh, 2017 showing that the majority of patients receiving uh, a 50cc balloon pump were at least responsive from the standpoint of uh, cardiac uh, hemodynamic parameters of, uh, of interest. 79% of uh, patients uh, implanted with a, a 50cc balloon pump were more likely to be responsive. And typically what you see is this, is diastolic hypertension once a 50cc pump goes in. And this has shifted our practice. When balloon pumps are used, it's almost exclusively uh, the mega balloon pump that we're, uh, that we're implanting. Um, once in a while, your back is against the wall and uh, you're forced to use a balloon pump rather than uh, a higher degree of support for uh, high-risk intervention. This is a, uh, uh, an elderly Jehovah's Witness, so it doesn't take blood, uh, who presented with a non-STEMI and CHF and then rapidly progressed to cardiogenic shock requiring a balloon pump and vasopressors, uh, was transferred over with a uh, sheathless uh, 50cc balloon pump from the outside with shock liver, congestive coagulopathy, acute kidney injury, and so forth about a day later after his presentation. Uh, he's also innovated and in receiving mechanical ventilation. In these three pictures, you can see that he's got fairly complex and fairly diffuse coronary artery disease. Um, and uh, we were actually able to get all of this done uh, with uh, a 50cc balloon pump in place, three vessel intervention from a right radial approach using a single universal guide, five DES, uh, less than 60 minutes, less than one gray, less than 100 cc's of contrast. So um, in select circumstances, there may yet be value and uh, I'm loath to pra practice my anecdotes, but this is to say that uh, every treatment decision, particularly with mechanical circulatory support, really needs to be an individualized decision as opposed to a cookbook decision. Um, Shifting gears now and talking about a different population, um, the, uh, the chronic heart failure population, uh, known HEFREF, uh, and uh, mapping this out using the Intermax uh, schema, 
the profile two and profile three patient, patients who are sliding on inotropes or dependent stability patients may also benefit from balloon pumps. This is a very important study that was published in uh, Euro Intervention last year by uh, Dan Yule and colleagues uh, looking at the value of uh, a 50 cc mega balloon pump versus inotropes in acute decompensated heart failure, looking at uh, hemodynamic parameters of interest, uh, cardiac power output in particular, mixed venous sat. And you could see that compared to inotropes, uh, the delta in CPO was better with balloon pump, uh, with a 50 cc balloon pump, as was uh, the delta in uh, mixed venous uh, um, saturation. And this is what, uh, what the Kaplan-Meier curves look like for uh, for the, uh, the shift in, uh, in uh, SVO2. Very small study, no difference in, uh, in hospital or 30-day mortality, but I think it at least proves the point from the standpoint of uh, surrogate endpoints and acute decompensated heart failure. There may be value of this uh, versus uh, using inotropes purely. Long-term ambulatory support of, uh, with balloon pumps has been uh, used in a number of centers for quite a number of years. We've been doing this for about 10 years at our institution with subclavian access for insertion of a balloon pump to rehab patients as they're waiting for, uh, for an LVAD or uh, waiting for, uh, for um, um, uh, cardiac transplant. And this is a nice way to get some, uh, some recovery uh, back uh, without having to, uh, to open the sternum. And this is a, a very typical patient. We have uh, usually about four or five patients in our CICU uh, that are uh, rehabbing with uh, subclavian balloon pumps. Um, and often uh, they're making significant progress. They arrive uh, with cardiac cachexia. And by the time of transplant or VAD, they're doing substantially better. Uh, and this is taken down, uh, the insertion site is taken down and the balloon pump removed at the time of their definitive uh, surgery. Moving on to uh, Impella. Uh, Impella is uh, the percutaneous microaxial heart pump everyone is familiar with. The four flavors that uh, are most commonly used are shown here. The Impella 2.5, the Impella CP, the 5.0, and the RP. Now there's also the 5.5 uh, the and uh, soon the BTR. Um, in this uh, dye chamber demonstration, you can see that uh, even the 2.5 device moves quite a bit of uh, blood, simulated blood, uh, saline with ethylene glycol and dye. Uh, in a rate independent, rhythm independent fashion, uh, and in doing so supports the ventricle to a, a pretty significant degree. And you can see what um, the acute pressure volume loops look like uh, in patients that are receiving a 2.5, a CP, and a 5.0 impella. There's a, a pretty remarkable leftward shift in that uh, acute uh, pressure volume loop uh, with this, uh, this triangular configuration, which is uh, reminiscent of surgical uh, VADs. Uh, when you have high filling pressures and you have uh, very good support from a, even a CP device, uh, sometimes if you drop a pigtail catheter in the left ventricle, you'll see uh, decoupling uh, of the uh, LV and aortic uh, waveforms. What that means is that the LV waveform is still pulsatile, but the LV systolic pressure remains below the aortic systolic pressure, which is now more linear or sort of an undulating line uh, with loss of uh, pulse pressure and a dramatic increase in the, uh, in the diastolic pressure, so LV aortic decoupling. PROTECT-2 uh, was a very important uh, study that uh, validated the use of Impella versus balloon pumps and high-risk PCI. The 90-day results are really what we navigate by, although uh, in the interest of uh, board's questions, uh, please keep in mind that the primary endpoint was the 30-day composite of major adverse events that are defined on the slide. Um, and these patients uh, undergoing elective high-risk intervention were randomized to uh, Impella support versus uh, IBP support using the Impella 2.5. You could see at the 30-day uh, uh, primary endpoint, there is a numerical but not statistically significant improvement in death stroke, myocardial infarction, and repeat revascularization, which becomes significant at, uh, at 90 days. More recently, we've seen the use of uh, uh, early use of uh, Impella in patients with acute uh, myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock. Um, these data uh, demonstrate that um, that the incidence of cardiogenic shock is stable to uptrending in the United States. Impella support is going up, balloon pump support is going down. And this is what started off as the Detroit Cardiogenic Shock in, uh, Initiative has now become the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative or NCSI. Um, and uh, there's this whole flow diagram uh, 
uh, that sort of maps out the eligibility of uh, these patients for receiving an impella early on, on the basis of uh, a cardiac power output that's below 0.6. I showed you before that CPO uh, less than 0.58 or less than 0.6 is essentially difficult to survive with, without some form of mechanical circulatory support. And the goal, the stated goal is to improve survival to discharge of greater than 80%. The initial pilot showed that there was a, an immediate improvement in cardiac power output on, uh, on pump with Impella CP. Uh, and compared to uh, historical, uh, uh, historical comparators, there's been an improvement in survival to ex, uh, explant. The story is obviously being scripted, and this is more of a registry than a, than a, a, a comparison uh, to uh, a, a, a contemporary con comparator arm. So, I would uh, urge some caution in, um, in applying these data, but uh, overall the data look quite favorable and uh, trending in the right direction. The third generation uh, Impella CP pump was unveiled at uh, SCAI 2017. and included uh, optimized hardware and software to uh, facilitate higher levels of support. Uh, and it was packaged with a 25 centimeter introducer sheet with a, uh, uh, a wire reaccess uh, port as well. Um, and with the optimized uh, platform, uh, you can accomplish quite a bit in the cath lab and also in the EP lab. This is um, uh, rapid implantation of an Impella CP uh, with pre-close, uh, all done in less than 10 minutes in the EP lab uh, in a uh, young patient that was uh, crashing and burning uh, with, uh, with an EF of 10%. Uh, and uh, with Impella CP support, we were able to consistently get 3.7 to 3.9 liters of support for the entire duration of the case. Uh, this was a VT ablation. It went many, many hours uh, for an interventionist that feels like many, many months. Uh, but I, I was assured that they completed this in uh, less than six hours, although it felt longer than that. Beautiful support all the way through the case, as you can see here, uh, with a successful resolution of three separate clinical VT circuits. The Impella RP is essentially the five liter device, the original five liter device, uh, the motor flipped backwards and then uh, put into this contoured uh, shaft that uh, traverses the uh, IVC into RA, RVOT, and into the uh, main pulmonary uh, artery. Overday, uh, overall survival in the recover right study was 73%, but uh, if you look at how you got to 73%, there was an 80 plus percent survival in cohort A who were patients who developed RV shock within 48 hours of implantation of a surgical left ventricular assist device. Cohort B is the, the wild type or de novo RV uh, shock patient who presents with a big uh, uh, occluded RCA. Survival was substantially lower in that, uh, in that population, and that's certainly been our experience as well. Uh, Impella RP plus uh, Impella CP support equals Bipella support, uh, which uh, becomes uh, uh, an expensive uh, but effective proposition for supporting somebody with acute uh, biventricular shock. This is the Abumed uh, Innovation Roadmap. There have been some uh, iterative changes to the platform, as I mentioned uh, before, as well as some future pump development that uh, is coming down the, uh, the pike in the near future. I think right now the Impella Smart Assist platform does uh, optimize uh, both the, um, the hardware as well as the software uh, to effectively deliver four liters of support from a, a CP device more consistently than you were ever able to uh, with the older uh, CP device. Uh, it also enables repositioning of the device using this optical sensor in the ICU without having to go back to the cath lab or without requiring imaging. Uh, and uh, this in the same way assists with, uh, with weaning of the device on the back end. So uh, you can uh, map out what the LV is doing, what the aorta is doing, and what native and uh, assisted flow is. Okay, on to Tandem Heart. Uh, the Tandem Heart PTVA system is shown here. This is the original uh, low prime uh, centrifugal pump um, that uh, was designed to reduce uh, left atrial pressure and wedge and uh, indirectly in unload the LV uh, without having to cross the aortic valve, reduce myocardial oxygen demand, impre uh, improve uh, mean arterial pressure and cardiac output. Um, the classic uh, LAFA circuit is shown here, left atrial, uh, uh, the left atrium is accessed via tr uh, standard transeptal technique, uh, and then a uh, 21 freight uh, French catheter is inserted across the septum, uh, and, uh, and then um, uh, you can use 15 to 17 French arterial return in the femoral artery. 
this is what you get in terms of pressure volume loops uh, with respect to uh, tandem part. Again, this is modeled. The real, uh, the real uh, PVLs that are uh, obtained in vivo look a little bit different than this, uh, but in an idealized PVL, this is what you get. Some of the uh, unloading of the left ventricle is offset by the fact that you are increasing afterload as you return blood against the native flow of blood. And so that's a consideration, but it is nice to get away from the aortic valve, particularly in patients with endocarditis or prosthetic aortic valves. This is really uh, uh, a, um, uh, a very good option for those types of patients who are uh, in cardiogenic shock. Um, tandem heart can also be used as a percutaneous uh, RBAD uh, application. This is what's uh, most often used at our institution, uh, which is uh, using 221 French cannula, uh, right uh, common femoral venous access, and the 72 centimeter 21 French cannula is the uh, transeptal cannula, um, uh, excuse me, is, uh, is the one that goes into the PA, and then uh, the 62 centimeter cannula is what goes into the right atrium. Uh, can also be used as a PR, uh, perc RVAD uh, uh, configuration using the Protect Duo, which is either 29 uh, French or 31 French at the skin, depending on which cannula you use, uh, connected up to the, uh, the pump and uh, effectively bypasses the failing right ventricle. You can cut an oxygenator into this and, uh, and basically turn this into VV ECMO, or you can turn this into a, a percutaneous oxy uh, RVAD using the Protect cannula. This is uh, the Protect Duo, 31 French at the skin, 16 French at the tip going in from right IJ uh, in a patient uh, with massive uh, PE and uh, cardiac arrest uh, who has already received 100 uh, milligrams of TPA uh, times two when she arrested uh, again. Uh, it was a little bit of a bloody procedure, but you could see what the cannula looks like uh, in place with the, um, with the, uh, the pump and, uh, and the sort of securing puck on the, uh, the patient's right shoulder. Uh, Protect Duo and uh, Tandem as an oxy RVAD in a COVID positive patient at our institution. The balloon pump is uh, left in. Uh, originally, this patient was on VA ECMO that was uh, decannulated at the bedside and uh, sewn up, and a balloon pump was uh, left in for a, uh, um, a mildly decreased uh, LV uh, uh, EF. Uh, and then uh, her oxygenation issues were addressed using uh, Protect Duo as an oxy RVAD from uh, right IJ approach. More recently, we saw uh, some very important improvements in the actual equipment. These, this is all the new equipment uh, from, uh, from Tandem Life or from, uh, from Livanova. Uh, the, this is the Tandem Life kit. The LifeSpark pump is a streamlined uh, pump with a better user interface and a touchscreen uh, with more power and uh, smaller than the previous generation. The redesigned uh, pump is smaller and more powerful, capable of supporting uh, up to eight liters of flow on the bench. Uh, it's rare that you actually need that amount of support, but it is nice to know that it uh, flows uh, at a higher level than, uh, than the previous pump. Uh, and then the rapid priming tray and the tandem lung oxygenator that, uh, that go along with the kit. Okay, some basic concepts in ECMO. When we're talking about uh, VA extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECLS, extracorporeal life support, the peripheral can uh, cannulation configuration shown in A and B are primarily what we're talking about. So VV ECMO is uh, rarely the, the right solution for somebody in cardiac arrest, but for pure hypoxemic uh, respiratory failure, uh, it's certainly uh, very useful. Um, VA ECMO, on the other hand, is what we use in the majority of patients with uh, profound um, uh, uh, cardiovascular compromise or, uh, or cardiac arrest. Um, there are other uh, configurations that are more exotic and require central cannulation or transcarotid uh, cannulation that we rarely uh, avail ourselves of. So femoral cannulation is what we most often do for VA ECMO. And the concept here, of course, is uh, you're uh, unloading the right side uh, indirectly by um, crossing the right atrium, going up into the SVC, draining the SVC, the right atrium, the IVC, uh, uh, externalizing that blood, oxygenating it, and then recirculating it uh, into the arterial circuit against the native flow of blood. There's some issues there, and we'll, we'll get to that here in just a second. Some additional considerations uh, for uh, peripheral cannulation. First and foremost, the size and uh, health of the peripheral arteri uh, arteries and the presence of peripheral arterial disease. Anti-grade perfusion is almost a must. Uh, if you have the luxury of a little bit of time pre-close and uh, management of the vascular access, uh, planning out the timing location and, um, and uh, sort of strategy for uh, decannulation, 
uh, securing the, trans, uh, the cannula for transport, and then uh, some additional issues, very importantly, venting. Um, the basic physiology of percutaneous uh, VA ECMO is, as shown here, the RA and IVC are partially drained, thereby decreasing RV filling. The arterial cannula generates retrograde aortic flow towards the aortic valve. Um, however, the sudden and often superphysiologic increases in afterload can uh, in dramatically increase LV wall stress, can uh, provoke or, uh, or worsen uh, subendocardial ischemia and LV distension. Uh, and, um, uh, and acute uh, cardiogenic shock patients are often uh, more prone to LV distension due to a non-compliant and previously normal LV and a competent mitral valve that will not serve as a pop-off valve. Uh, decompensated heart failure patients have dilated LVs and uh, often have functional MR. And so uh, these patients may actually uh, manifest as uh, relatively uh, non-descended LV, but uh, pulmonary edema uh, rather than uh, acute uh, distension. This is what the PVLs look like, normal in red, severe heart failure in dark red, and supported by VA ECMO. You're moving in the wrong direction. The rightward shift in the LVPV uh, loop uh, indicates LV dilation, which is worsened by VA ECMO, primarily through the increase in afterload. Um, and with uh, different, uh, different forms of LV venting, you can see what an intraortic balloon pump brings to the party, which is a modest amount of unloading. Um, uh, 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 LV venting, direct LV venting uh, is, uh, is better, um, uh, but that requires uh, surgical intervention. Atrial septostomy uh, at least temporizes you with a pop-off valve uh, and most effectively uh, unloading with uh, impella CP, uh, moving uh, towards the left of that pressure volume loop. Why do we care about LV venting in uh, percutaneous VA ECMO? Well, um, there is this domino effect, and uh, as you get into LV distension uh, and increase uh, PA pressures, uh, incompetence of the mitral valve. You often get stasis and clot formation in the LV uh, uh, apex and in uh, the aortic root. Uh, and then there's impaired LV recovery. And often you get to a state where the LV is completely unweanable. You turn down the ECMO uh, cannula uh, in the hopes that uh, the ischemia has passed, the LV is recovering, and you, what you find is a non-pulsatile, non-contractile left ventricle. Indications for LV venting are shown here. Uh, elevated wedge, distended hypocontractile LV, stagnation of blood, uh, aortic valve that's remaining closed throughout the cardiac cycle or the majority of the cardiac cycle, uh, oxygenation issues and pulmonary edema and ventricular arrhythmias or evidence of subendocardial ischemia are all reasons to uh, vent. And we vent the majority of patients that we put on percutaneous ECMO. Um, here's uh, some data to support that, uh, nearly 4,000 patients <laughs> excuse me, with cardiogenic shock supported by percutaneous uh, ECMO and eventing strategies associated uh, with a lower mortality, uh, albeit still a very high mortality, but lower mortality than unvented patients. And so uh, let me just take you through a case. Uh, we've talked a lot about all the different strategies. Here are, uh, here's a, uh, a case uh, that we sort of availed of all of these different things. 62-year-old guy who was previously well uh, underwent um, LAD diag uh, stenting at our institution, um, now presents one month later uh, to an outside institution with two to three hours of crushing chest pain, um, and he reports missing at least three days of his medications, regrettably, uh, because of the cost associated with filling those medications. You could see on the ECG that he's got tombstone ST elevations and a completely occluded LAD. Um, uh, complete thrombotic occlusion, which uh, one of my partners uh, opened up very nicely. Both the uh, LAD as well as the uh, the diag is treated, uh, and uh, some more metal is implanted, and a final kissing balloon inflation uh, shows uh, good flow. Uh, there's some truncation of that diag, uh, but you're also uh, starting to see something very ominous, which is a dyskinetic uh, LV apex uh, when you look at the motion of the uh, the distal uh, uh, LAD. His numbers don't look great. Um, 45 uh, is his uh, mixed venous sat. Uh, a balloon pump is, uh, is chosen initially uh, with an improvement in uh, mixed venous saturation to, uh, to 50%. Uh, he's transported to the CCU with improved uh, um, uh, clinical status, uh, uh, um, resolution of his chest pain, uh, urinating, no further chest pain, no shortness of breath, and so forth. However, um, a short while later, his mixed venous doesn't look so good anymore. Uh, and uh, he's brought right back to the cath lab uh, for exchange to an Impella CP. And so here's uh, the balloon pump out, CP in, uh, a requisite uh, PA catheter uh, that's in place. Uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, things are back up again. So uh, mixed venous SAD of 49% goes up to nearly 80% uh, with Impella CP. Uh, but after 12 hours of CP and weaning of his pressors, uh, his mixed venous SAD is right down back, uh, right back to uh, 49%. And you can see that these are different numbers. Uh, it's uh, remarkable. His SAD went back to exactly what it was uh, before the uh, balloon pump was exchanged. So um, originally the plan was for surgical centromag. This guy uh, looked like a reasonable surgical candidate and reasonable transplant candidate. However, clinical deterioration sort of uh, forced our hand and uh, this is placement of VA ECMO uh, in the CCU uh, at the bedside with uh, ultrasound and, uh, and, uh, and echo guidance um, with the Impella CP left in uh, as a vent. Uh, the A is in, the uh, anagrade perfusers in, the V just went in. Uh, so 19 French A, uh, 25 French vented venous cannula, de-aired, connected, and uh, on pump. Um, so uh, Impella CP is left at P6, 2.4 liters of flow. We've got uh, great support at this point. This is what the chest x-ray looks like. And after five days of support and very little weaning ability, the decision was made to proceed to an expedited transplant eval with LVAD Centromag. Uh, placed and then um, an oxy RVAD placed from uh, from right IJ. The Impella CP was removed and peripheral ECMO was decannulated. Um, so that's sort of the the sort of uh, the story of a typical patient that undergoes uh, escalation and uh, objective uh, sort of parameters for for uh, therapy ch uh, changes uh, with different forms of mechanical circulatory support. In uh, the last 10 minutes or so, I want to cover some of the contemporary clinical data, which I think are very boards testable. Uh, we've shared, uh, I've shared with you the uh, early balloon pump data and some of the meta-analysis data. What about use of more supportive devices like PVADs versus intraoretic balloon pump? Uh, this question really began with uh, ISAR shock, 26 patients that were uh, randomized to balloon pump versus Impella 2.5. Uh, the primary endpoint was the change in the cardiac index and baseline from baseline to 30 minutes and some secondary endpoints as you can uh, see here. And while patients who received an Impella 2.5 uh, did improve in terms of um, uh, initial cardiac output, um, uh, the cardiac power index was higher for Impella at 30 minutes only, no significant difference at any other time points and no difference in 30 day mortality, balloon pumps versus uh, Impella 2.5. Um, and so more recently, uh, we saw data from IMPRESS. Uh, again, a, a very small trial, 48 patients of uh, STEMI plus cardiogenic shock randomized to balloon pump versus Impella. Um, and 30-day uh, mortality was the primary endpoint. 30-day mortality was no different in the Impella versus the Impella CP versus the balloon pump group. Um, it should be noted that the plurality of patients uh, died because of anoxic brain injury in the study. Uh, and this is sort of an echo to IBP shock too, where these patients are so desperately ill, it really uh, uh, raises the question, what if anything would actually save these patients? No difference, uh, interestingly, in serum lactate either in uh, IMPRESS. There have been several meta-analyses you should be familiar with. Uh, the 2009 meta-analysis, balloon pumps versus tandem heart plus impella representing PVADs, no difference in 30-day mortality. 2017 uh, meta-analysis, no difference in 30-day mortality. The 2018 meta-analysis and trial sequential analysis of PVADs versus a balloon pump, uh, no difference in short-term uh, or long-term all-cause mortality. And uh, use of PVADs in this analysis seemed to be associated with more adverse events compared to balloon pump. Um, there are some ongoing RCTs of mechanical circulatory support that uh, are, will hopefully bring some clarity to the space. This is uh, the SHIELD-2 trial that uh, has had a series of starts and stops with the, uh, uh, the Thortec and now Abbott uh, PHP device, a 24 French self-expanding device that opens up uh, to 24 French uh, across the aortic valve and provides a very high level of support. As I said, there have been some issues with this device by way of device stoppage and uh, patient morbidity and mortality that uh, stopped the trial. Uh, but as of uh, June, this trial is back online and uh, enrolling against Impella 2.5. The Danish shock trial, uh, which uh, with the addition of Germany becomes the cleverly uh, named danger shock trial now, uh, is uh, enrolling, uh, as well as the STEMI DTU trial on the heels of the, uh, the very positive or very reassuring STEMI uh, DTU pilot uh, that was published by Naveen Kapoor and colleagues uh, uh, after its presentation at AHA in Chicago just a couple of years ago. 
So um, where are we at? Uh, I mean, I've presented a lot of data, uh, mechanistic and clinical, and uh, it seems like the higher support devices seem to be out of sync with the uh, clinical improvement that you should see. There should be consistent clinical improvement with uh, uh, PVADs versus balloon pumps. And perhaps the reason where there is a disconnect uh, in clinical outcomes and uh, mechanistic support or support on the bench is the issue of large bore access bleeding and complications. This is a, an important paper that was published in 2017, a retrospective analysis of nearly 18,000 patients receiving large bore access, TAVR, EVAR, or PVAD, um, and bleeding complications in this uh, study was defined as any transfusion, hemorrhage, or hematoma, or the need for percutaneous or surgical intervention. Nearly one in five patients receiving uh, large bore access actually had a major bleeding event. Of the PVAD population, you could see here one in four of these patients uh, had a major bleeding event that more than doubled the length of stay and added nearly 19,000 to the cost uh, uh, to that patient. Uh, these data, unfortunately, are replicable. This is data from our own institution that was uh, presented as an oral uh, presentation at uh, CRT this year, uh, which regrettably, uh, thanks to COVID, is the, is the last major conference I think that any one of us uh, actually got to attend. Uh, 127 patients uh, at our institution. Uh, and you can see that uh, first and foremost, there are vast differences in outcome based on why these patients received an impella, cardiac arrest, uh, all the way to high-risk uh, PCI uh, or VT ablation, very different trajectories for these patients. When you look at bleeding, type 3 through uh, 5 BARC uh, classification for bleeding, we didn't have any type 3C or type 4. 19% um, of these patients, one in five patients, had a major complication uh, uh, after uh, impella uh, implant. The vast majority of these were uh, impella CP implant. Um, and the predictors of bleeding following impella placement look like this. When you upgraded these patients to ECPELA, you had a lot of bleeding, not necessarily ascribable to the impella, it's partly ascribable to the ECMO, you, but you definitely had a lot of bleeding. If they needed to go back to the cath lab for replacement or reposition, if they were implanted in the context of cardiogenic shock or cardiac arrest, uh, they also had a very high uh, likelihood of bleeding. And unfortunately, there's a nearly two and a half fold increase in the one year mortality hazard uh, associated with major hemorrhage in this, uh, in this population. Uh, most recently, we saw two very important publications that uh, I think everyone should be at least conversant with. Uh, I'm at the means paper from the premier database, uh, 48,000 patients undergoing PCI with mechanical circulatory support for a, a wide variety of reasons. Uh, finding that impella uh, versus balloon pumps were associated with a higher rate of death, bleeding, uh, and stroke. Uh, and then uh, Sanka Druva's paper, um, uh, uh, in 28,000 patients undergoing PCI for AMI with cardiogenic shock, uh, use of impella uh, compared to a balloon pump was associated with uh, a higher risk of in-hospital death and in-hospital major bleeding. Um, a word of caution, both of these come from large administrative data sets. Uh, as best as the investigators could, the bias was all scrubbed and the confounders were all scrubbed from this. But at the end of the day, in retrospective and claims level analyses, it's almost impossible to get rid of all of these biases. So hopefully more to come uh, to, to clarify that. Um, let me just summarize uh, where I use different devices for high-risk PCI and cardiogenic shock. Is there a use for balloon pumps? The answer, I think, is a qualified yes. Uh, maybe stage A to B shock uh, at least gets these patients into a higher level of uh, care and uh, under a different set of eyes. Uh, perhaps a BSIS-1 type PCI population, maybe. Uh, venting for peripheral VA ECMO in patients uh, who are dilating uh, rapidly uh, and whose aortic valves are, are still opening. Uh, tandem heart in stage C through D. Uh, it is useful in stage E uh, in, in extremis patients with uh, cardiogenic shock. The problem is implanting this device safely and doing a transeptal puncture and maintaining that cannula in somebody who's crashing and burning can be very, very challenging. High-risk PCI in patients with mechanical AVRs, aortic stenosis, or aortic valve endocarditis, or an LV thrombus uh, is really a, a sweet spot for, uh, for tandem. Uh, and then, of course, use of tandem as, a, as an oxy-RVAD is what we primarily do in our institution. The majority of patients getting implanted with uh, Impella, ECMO, or both ECPELA. Uh, Impella for stage C through D shock, uh, complex PCI with HEFREF, low CPO, irrespective of how that patient looks, uh, especially in the context of STEMI. Um, and then stage E shock or ECPR is with, uh, with percutaneous ECMO. Uh, particularly if hypoxemia is part of the picture, uh, and in refractory LV or BIV shock with or without oxygenation issues, we usually pull the trigger on ECPELA in, uh, in those patients. 
I think I'm right at time. Uh, I'll stop right there. Thanks so much. That's great. Uh, thanks a lot, Sandeep. That was a phenomenal talk. So let me, um, while fellows questions come in, um, I'll start off with a few practical questions if you can help us with those. Sure. So what, what would you do? How would you um, replace? Impellers get pulled out quite a bit uh, once they go to the CCU. What, how, would you, how should fellows deal with this? Should they get an echo? Should they replace it bedside? Or should you go back to the lab? Um, what do you all do? Yeah. That's a, I think it's a great and very practical question. Um, I think, you know, two things are very important, right? Um, you know, first and foremost, the impella has to be doing what it's supposed to. When you have hemolysis, uh, hemorrhage, or, you know, if it gets snarled up in the submitral apparatus, uh, bad things happen. You're better off not having the impella than having an impella that's hemolyzing or creating mechanical complications. So it's, you know, placement is critical. What we typically do is we, uh, we echo in the cath lab with fluoroscopic confirmation to know exactly where we're at. And we text that image, the loop of the ECMO, uh, of the echo to absolutely everybody that's going to be involved in their care for the next 24 hours to say, look it, this is what it looks like on fluoro. This is what it looks like on, on echo. This is what you need to get back to. This is what the screen looks like with all of the different waveforms, the LV signal, the aortic signal, and so forth. When we get to the unit, we actually uh, um, replicate that echo and just make sure that the echo remains exactly as it is. That's, uh, I think, a really critical thing to anchor. Um, in patients where you think that you have actually um, uh, gotten under the submitral apparatus or there's a, a very serious complication of the impella, we've seen knuckling of the catheter in the LV when the patient has, uh, their sedation has wear, worn off and they've actually sat up. Uh, we've actually seen the entire impella go and knuckle in the, uh, in the LV. I think uh, that's a call to, to action to get back into the cath lab and uh, deal with this in a more deliberate fashion. Great. Um, could you comment a little bit about um, leg perfusion or peripheral perfusion? Yeah. Um, so peripheral perfusion is absolutely critical with large bore access. Now, when you're doing percutaneous ECMO, um, every uh, arterial cannula, whether you're using Biomedicus or whether you're using, um, we typically use the, the Protec uh, L, uh, tandem cannula for our arterial simply because it has a nice sewing ring uh, and um, a butterfly to tie down the cannula to make sure that it doesn't go anywhere. That, uh, that ring uh, prevents the cannula being, from being pushed too far into the body, into the wide part, and the, uh, the butterfly ensures that that cannula doesn't move. All of these arterial cannulas have a side port. Um, the, uh, the five cent commodity in the cath lab that uh, everybody's scrambling for is the mail to mail connector. Um, it's, uh, it's this tiny little widget that if you don't have it, you're gonna have a very tough time connecting up to your uh, distal perfuser. Typically what we'll do uh, when it's sort of a controlled descent uh, to ECMO, we will try to put in retrograde A and V first with uh, small bore, so six and seven French uh, A and V respectively. And then we'll use fluoro mapping off that A and ultrasound uh, to get the antegrade stick with a six to seven French um, uh, distal perfuser, which is typically uh, an 11 centimeter arrow sheath arrow because it's kink resistant. Uh, and so that awkward angle that you're going into that SFA or the CFA uh, doesn't result in the sheath kinking uh, and clotting off. Um, and then we connect up. There have been rare cases. There was a, a TAVR case that went sideways uh, for me about a month ago um, where the left main thrombosed and we crashed to ECMO. This was a morbidly obese patient, BMI of nearly uh, 45, I want to say. Uh, and antegrade perfusion was just not possible through the conventional mechanism. In that case, what we actually did uh, was we uh, had six French access on the other side we essentially went up and over, went past the arterial cannula with great difficulty using a hydrophilic wire. Um, and we put a, a six French uh, multipurpose A1 guide uh, down into the SFA and use that as a distal perfuser and slave that off of the side port of the uh, arterial cannula. So uh, left-sided access up and over, some form of distal perfusion is necessary. If you've got uh, occlusion with an impella sheet, the first move is to take out the, the um, um, the uh, peel away sheet and then put in the ICU sheet, that often fixes the problem. But if it doesn't fix the problem, you may need to get antegrade access and slave it off of a second point of access, uh, whether it's brachial or preferably uh, contralateral femoral. Great. Um, 
perhaps the next question is a topic um, that is a one hour lecture on its own, but could you comment on anti-coagulation for the different kinds of um, support? And Dr. Sindhu's asking the same question. Have you had to run your impeller without heparin ever? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we've definitely had, you know, we've had various complications, whether it's RP bleeds or whether it's, uh, you know, more commonly, um, you know, uh, uh, strokes with, uh, you know, with hemorrhagic transformation that's uh, prevented us from anticoagulating. Typically, what we'll do is we'll put uh, heparin in the purge. So at least the, the motor is getting bathed in uh, heparinized saline. Um, uh, or we'll run the pump uh, without uh, uh, anticoagulation at the, you know, we'll let it auto flow at the highest speed that the, that the filling pressures will allow. It's not great, obviously. Um, and so, uh, you know, in patients with HIT, we run it with, uh, with bivalrudin, although um, we went round and round with Abimed on this, uh, this issue. There is no uh, labeling for use of bivalrudin or any direct thrombin inhibitor in patients who are HIT positive. They only have FDA approved labeling uh, for use of heparin. Um, it's okay to run the heparin, uh, you know, relatively low, you know, during an intervention, we're running the ACTs in the 250 to 300 range, but afterwards, uh, and that's what's recommended for, uh, you know, 250 minimum at the time of implant. Uh, but for idling the pump, uh, whether it's CP or RP, we typically uh, aim for a PTT um, of 60 or so, 60 to 70, uh, or an ACT of, uh, uh, of, uh, of about 200. Um, so, you know, the short answer, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very long answer. The short answer is, yes, we've had to do it. We don't love doing it. If at all possible, we at least try to put some, uh, we try to put some heparin in the purge, if not systemically. Wait, how would you decide when to wean um, your impellas or other uh, mechanical circulatory support after you worked in the lab? Yeah, another another great question that we could we could go for we could go for an hour on uh, on weaning. I had the pleasure of giving a, a weaning talk, I think, at ISMCS a few years ago, and you know it's it's a very nuanced and granular question. I think that you know the way I would answer it is with data. Um, you know sort of weaning simply on the empiric sort of the patient looks good is not a great way to do this. So the majority of patients that go to the unit with an impella, whether it's in the context of cardiogenic shock or high-risk PCI, um, require uh, a PA catheter for some objective metrics to wean against. If your hand is forced by mechanical complications, be it bleeding or hemolysis, then I think you just go a little bit faster. But otherwise, you're uh, weaning based on the cardiometabolic parameters, CPO, uh, happy, uh, filling pressures, mixed venous sat, and, uh, and lactate um, is generally what we're weaning against. Awesome. Uh, so thank you again so much. Uh, that was a great talk and uh, great input and great answer. So Dr. Ashmit. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Really appreciate all your contribution and thank you very much for doing this. Well, that was an excellent talk, great review. Uh, we will be having a panel, a panel discussion about, in about uh, an hour later from now. If you're able to join us, that would be very helpful. Absolutely. Thank Again. you. Um, so at this time, you know, we are on to our last talk. After this, we'll just have the panel discussion. So uh, if, uh, if you, um, I would like to see if the panel, if the rest of my planning committee is able to join me at this time. Um, just wanted to say a word of thanks uh, to all the speakers. This is. Uh, week 16 of our lecture series. This would not have been possible without the commitment of all our speakers. They had given up a lot of their important time on the weekends to, to do this uh, for us. I would also say a big thank you to all the uh, attendees and the fellows who have been joining us week after week on Saturday mornings and supporting our lecture series. Thank you. We got tons of positive emails and uh, positive feedback and um, that's been a great motivation for everybody. So thank you very much for all that. And I would like to thank the ACC and the Iowa ACC and uh, also the Early Career Chapter for partnering, partnering with us. Uh, without the forum of the ACC, this would not have been possible. Um, Roy or Poonam, I don't know if you're able to say a few words at this time. Yes, I'm here, Dr. Rashford. Thank you so much. And uh, this was really a, a great pressure and a great effort uh, from all of us. Um, I really like to thank uh, you know, uh, the fellows at the University of Iowa as well for their support. Uh, as well as you and uh, Nancy and uh, Dr. Valagapati uh, for all their guidance. Uh, uh, personally, this was a, a 
great endeavor and a lot of learning for me as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you to all the faculty and all the attendees. And um, yeah, I don't want to keep Dr. Kimi waiting. So uh, very excited to have her, one of the uh, best female interventional operators in the country. So I'll, Dr. Ashwath will introduce her. Thanks, Poonam. So also uh, Nancy, our chapter executive, is not able to uh, kind of put in a word, but she can conveys the same. Uh, thank you to the ACC and thank you to the great speakers we had. Uh, it's been an awesome experience for everybody. So thank you all very much. I'll move on to introducing uh, Dr. Kinney. Dr. Annapurna Kinney is internationally acclaimed for her special expertise in performing complex coronary interventions, especially in chronic total occlusion for patients with advanced coronary artery disease, high-risk interventional cases, and alcohol subtle ablation for the treatment of obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kinney has been the principal or co-investigator in numerous <coughs> clinical trials. She has extensive experience with mitral and aortic balloon valvuloplasty and has been among the first few interventional cardiologists in the country to use the transcutaneous aortic valve implantation procedure in the treatment of inoperable patients with critical aortic stenosis. She has also made history by, for, by performing the first live case performed entirely by women during CRT meeting on March 5, 2018. Dr. Kinney performs more than 1,000 coronary interventions annually, the highest number by a female interventionist in the United States, with an extremely low complication rate of less than 0.3%. An official report from the Department of Health recognized Dr. Kinney as the safest operator among 350 other physicians in the state of New York numerous times between 2004 and 2016. She is the recipient of the 2011 Dean's Award for Excellence in Clinical Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital. She also received the Physician of the Year Award in 2014 from the Mount Sinai Hospital Nurses and received the Excellence of Medicine Award from the National Association of Physicians of India in July of 2016. In May 27, she, 2017, she, uh, she received the prestigious Ellis Island Medal of Honor, the highest award given to any immigrant civilian, and in 2018, she received the American Heart Association Heart of Gold Award. Dr. Kinney is a keen researcher, particularly recognized for her studies pertaining to intracoronary imaging studies, including IVUS, NERS, and OCT, and trials such as Yellow, Canary, Orbit have made major headlines. She has published more than 100 peer-reviewed scientific publications and book chapters in major cardiology textbooks. She is the recipient of the Rockstar of Science Award from the American Heart Association and is a member of the Royal College of Physicians of London and the Fellow of the ACC. Most recent ELO2 study was an ambitious translational combination of multimodality imaging with clinically relevant cellular biology and comprehensive transcriptomics. Dr. Kinney is an excellent teacher and dedicated to the teaching of both cardiology and interventional fellows. In fact, the 2012 batch of Mount Sinai Interventional Cardiology Fellows created a teaching award in her name, the Annapurna S. Kinney uh, uh, Choice Award, Fellows Choice Award for, excellent in, uh, for Excellence in Teaching. Her achievements are not limited to serving as the director of annual life symposium of complex coronary cases at the Mount Sinai Hospital, one of the most attended and respected meetings in the field of interventional cardiology in the country. She is also the director of monthly webcast program, CCC Live Cases, that has a worldwide audience of 10,000 plus physicians spanning more than 130 countries. Dr. Kinney, we understand and we recognize how busy you are and we really appreciate your time and commitment to fellow education. She's going to be talking to us about complications of PCI and their management. Thank you, Dr. Mahi and uh, the ACC for uh, inviting me uh, to give this talk to the fellows. And like you had mentioned during the introduction, I would love to teach fellows what my experience has been during, uh, you know, having learned doing, uh, during PCIs. Can you share, uh, can you see my screen? No, we can we can see your screen and we can hear you nicely. Yeah, for some reason I don't see it moving. You see your title slide in this time. Yeah, I'm trying to move it, but I don't see. Maybe I stop sharing and share again. One second. Okay. Okay, good. 
I think it was a standstill for a long time. That's good. Okay, going through what are the coronary complications uh, during intervention, uh, what we see in the cath lab, um, as you see here, is uh, abrupt vessel closure. And what is abrupt vessel closure is acute closure of the vessel, which most important think, reason. Sorry, Annapurna, I don't think we're seeing your movies. So we're just seeing the title slide. Oh, okay. Let's go back. It says your screen was paused. Hold on. Are you able to see now? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, yes. good. So coronary complications that you see while uh, we are doing procedure in the cath lab includes uh, abrupt vessel closure, which most like cause is coronary dissection uh, due to a device, which is other because of balloon or a stent. Uh, could be acute thrombus or also what is called as a guide induced dissection that you normally see. Now the incidence of acute uh, closure is just about 0.3%. Next important uh, complication could be coronary artery perforation. Again, could be wire perforation or device perforation. And uh, I'll go over some of the cases. And other important thing is atherectomy, which are many of the interventionists uh, which uh, like to do this procedure, but deadly complication could be slow flow, no reflow, but burr entrapment that happens uh, with the rotation atherectomy. Of course, uh, you would see air embolism uh, versus slow flow to other reasons also. Very rarely you could see what is called as a longitudinal stent deformation or a device uh, uh, embolization. Some reason this is just not moving. Hold on. Do you have it in slideshow, Dr. Kini? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the complication, you can see the next slide here? Yes, we can see. Okay, so the complications of the New York State. So this is just for us to have an idea what are the complications that we normally come across. But important is the acute occlusion that I just mentioned, less than 0.2% or so. The rest, strength thrombosis is everything is uh, acute or later on. So this is a ACC NCDR. Uh, what you see, perforation 0.4% or dissection is again less than 1%. This is just to give you an overall idea that these complications are rare. Some of them could be catastrophic or deadly, but when you are in the cath lab, you have to know how to handle this complication. So this is my job in the next 40 minutes to, to go over this. So many of the cases that I'm going to show you is from the live webcast that we have been doing for the last 11 years. And you can go on the cccliveCases.org, uh, depending on what you want to watch, all the cases are there along with the slides, uh, um, slideshow. So the first case that I'm going to show was uh, way back June 18, 2013. And uh, at that time, uh, Spencer King uh, did come for the live case uh, during that case. So this was June uh, 13. 62-year-old uh, male who had history of prior cabbage, uh, uh, you see 824, but within few months, he had occlusion of the Lima to LAD, presented with the uh, ischemia, and subsequently had a cat at outside hospital, um, which had, uh, for which he had a LAD strength for a, a LAD since the Lima was occluded, but a cat later on, uh, which had shown that he had uh, occlusion of his vein graft to the circ also, so the recommendation was that he should go for redo cabbage, but declined cabbage and came for high risk PCI to Mount Sinai. So this is what he had, distal left main, LAD circumflex. I'm going to show you the plan was to do LAD left main PCI along with the suck. So this is the LV gram with the normal EF. And if you see here, the left system where you can see the left main significantly diseased, you can see instant restenosis of the LAD and involvement of the circumflex RCA was uh, non-dominant and small. So this is just uh, to tell you the uh, angiogram on the spider view, which is very important for, for the fellows who are watching to understand if you want to see distal left main, osteal LAD, osteal circumflex, the best view will be a spider view. So many of these views will be asked as part of uh, your uh, board questions, uh, which view is the best view to see 
this particular thing. So the recommendation is, what will you do? I know the patient was recommended cabbage. Now the patient comes to you, you do the angiogram. Do you still say, okay, I will do PCI, or do we say continue or a redo cabbage? Uh, so, of course, the question is, I think the previous uh, people have discussed uh, LV support or no, but since EF is normal, if you decide that this patient needs LV support, it will be an IABP. At this time, that is also, since it's uh, the recommend, uh, there is a, uh, uh, that Impella could be used only uh, in this kind of cases, despite normal LV because of left main and patient, uh, you know, surgeons, patient had refused bypass. So, Imaging was done, if you see here. So what does the imaging, which was OCT, was done, if you see that, and I will tell you why this will help us later on, that part of the strength strut, if you can see here, uh, part of the strength strut is sticking into the circumflex. So when they place the osteal LED stent, part of it was covering the circumflex. Um, plus you will see a heterogeneous instant restenosis and jail circumflex uh, here. Now the question comes, you're going to do the left main to LED PCI that would you wire the circumflex or no? It's, uh, of course you want to wire the circumflex and what is the key, uh, key questions for the uh, operators here that uh, since part of the strength strut is sticking in the left main, you got to use a polymer coated jacketed wire so that you are wiring into the osteal circumflex, not through the strength strut that is sticking out, you've got to be away from that. So as usual, you wire the circumflex, you have the LED, and then you are doing the uh, you know, cutting balloon since it is uh, the LED, we are doing the cutting balloon, and this is how it looks. As soon as we do the cutting balloon, uh, there is acute closure of the left main. So once we are doing the uh, cutting balloon, what happens is he probably, remember that you had significant left main disease and instant restenosis. Maybe the flow in the LED was, uh, slow, he did have more chest pain and just he moved, the guide catheter came out, which is not, um, it is uncommon, but it can happen. So when that happened, then he had acute closure. And what happens with this, a patient like this, uh, left main circumflex, RC was not dominant. Of course, patient go into refractory V-fib requiring so a lot of shock. So at this time, uh, what will you do when this catastrophe happens? That you will want to have a um, uh, support. So the multiple things are happening. So one operator is, uh, you know, getting the guiding, trying to wire, and other place the patient is going to VTV fib. So you're shocking. At the same time, there's no blood pressure. You're trying to give uh, epi and other things. But you know, we have this device which every cath lab should have it because this uh, device do, does do symmetrical chest compression, not causing any, um, you know, breakage of the chest uh, ribs. So ACLS was continued and at the same time from the left side, immediately what you can do is try, since EF was normal when we started, you can take uh, IABP, which uh, was at that time we planned to do. So the question now comes is, uh, the patient is still, uh, you know, acute closure. Um, we are trying to, you know, resuscitate him. Uh, did you want to you know, insert impella, call a cardiac surgeon or continue resuscitation, we call the quit. So resuscitation continues, okay. At the same time, you see that we are getting the guide and uh, we see whether we can wire, we were able to wire into the LED, there's no flow in the circumflex. And at least we know we had ballooned the LED, wired the LED and we placed a stent in the LED and uh, post dilated. With the, doing that, so we did get some flow back into the LED and, uh, as you see here. And this is how the circumflex was completely gone. Now we have left main to LED uh, stent, and we already knew the stent, uh, original stent uh, was uh, partly jailing the circumflex, but able to wire with the fielder wire. And same first thing that you're going to use is a small balloon, which is a 2-0 uh, track balloon. You will go uh, open the circumflex. And uh, once you open, then you have to go with a larger balloon to get a wider uh, uh, you know, strut opening of the left main stent and then able to place a stent and uh, do a kissing balloon uh, dilation. So subsequent uh, hospital course, what happened is uh, since he had a long resuscitation, uh, we did place him on uh, ECMO so for the recovery. So he did stay in the hospital for uh, many days uh, with uh, no other uh, you know, uh, neurological or any other um, end organ damage. Uh, EF was good and uh, he uh, followed with us for a few years with a good outcome.
So the catastrophe can happen even with the best hands, but how do you tackle this is that you need to have a lot of the devices in the cath lab and some of these devices we will go over, but um, important device that you need is uh, either a balloon pump, you need to have your uh, Impella as well as your ECMO there. So this, after that, uh, Dr. Uh, you know, Spencer King actually wrote an editorial you know, about live cases being done. So he just mentioned that he was invited, but more important what he says is that you learn from this complication. That is why many times when this complication happens, it is um, you uh, learn, but the thing is, even with the adversities that you learned, you keep doing them so that you will not repeat the same mistakes of the, uh, what had happened in the first case. So the various uh, LBSs devices, which uh, they have gone through, is balloon pump, is a tandem heart, uh, uh, impella. So this could be, this question could come in the boards where when your EF is uh, normal, you can, uh, when it's more than 35% or normal, use a balloon pump if you're doing a complex PCI. If you are doing a, a EF between 20 to 35, simple case, maybe IABP or impella, but if you have a complex with a high syntax score, um, then you consider definitely placing an impeller. If the EF is less than 20, that's the time I think you have to consider the current uh, ECMO uh, to be done uh, so that your PCI is done either with the impella or uh, ECMO. So question related something to this could uh, come during the board. This is a portable heart lung machine, which is now uh, available and every cath lab should have it so that if you have a catastrophe, you can make a decision which uh, support that you want to use uh, during the case. So now uh, going over uh, case number two, which is a 81 year old uh, male who presents with progressive angina and a past medical history of hypertension, prior MI and three vessel disease. So proximal LED was to, uh, occluded, uh, sorry, proximal RC occluded, your proximal LED disease, uh, circumflex disease, and this is the key, the EF was about 30% or so. So uh, patient had RCA PCI and then presented to us for left main LED PCI. So this is the EF here. And since the EF was low, we had decided that uh, we will need some kind of a support before we do LED PCI, uh, sorry, uh, left main PCI so went with the uh, balloon pump. So this is just to say the RCA when he came back, the PCI site looked uh, good. This is how the left side uh, you see here. So distal left main circumflex disease. And what do you see in the LED? Just after the diagonal origin here, you see here heavy calcium, tram track calcium on uh, angiography. So this is the kind of case where you would definitely use rotational atherectomy. And this is the kind of the case where you likely do tuber technique uh, for while you're doing rotational atherectomy that you're not going to go with the larger bar uh, uh, in the beginning. So just to uh, show you the complexity of the case, distal left main, you have your ramus and uh, significant disease of the um, LED here. So this is a uh, 1.25 rotabar and you can see the balloon pump that's already working and helping us. And one after 1.25 rotabar was done, on the right side, you can see 1.75 uh, rotabar that was used to do rotational atherectomy of the mid to distal LED. So after rotational atherectomy, this is the usual um, uh, angiography that you see that it has done uh, you know, significant uh, atherectomy uh, without any dissection and there was no slow flow. So after this, what you do, you will uh, place a wire side by side and then you will go with your uh, balloon to see uh, how the, it expands. And on the right side, you see a stent was placed. And geography looks good. Now question comes, you have a, a, a diagonal also. How are we going to take care of this uh, diagonal? So you definitely have to uh, wire it and uh, um, you know, balloon it that we see on the left side. So what is called a skip it open strategy, KIO we call it, uh, is that you do not lose the diagonal when you are placing the stent in the proximal LED. So the proximal LED stent was placed. And now you go to the caudal view, which is on the right side, so you understand what exactly will be seen. So we placed the, uh, when you're doing the uh, left main to LED uh, stent, always go to the caudal view. This is another uh, question uh, as well as teaching point for the fellows. And this is exactly post dilation. So, so this is the key. So you post dilated with the 4 with a you know, 20 at 18 atmosphere 
this is what we call, which is called as since the left main uh, part of the stent is in the left main, you want to optimize uh, pot proximal optimization with a four five short balloon, which was at a 20 atmosphere. And guess what happens? So that caused the perforation. It was not just a perforation because there is a calcium. Uh, we already placed a stent and now we went with a higher pressure balloon, uh, which caused the perforation. And uh, this kind of perforation, uh, what do we uh, say? The, what happens that there will be acute collapse, okay, acute circulatory collapse of the patient where you, this patient already on balloon pump, balloon pump is not going to save this patient where you see again, uh, what you have to do immediately, which we always teach, and this is a routine protocol in the Mount Sinai cath lab is once you have done a balloon or you have placed a stent, that balloon or the so-called STS does not come out of the body. It stays in the guide. So we will do an angiogram. So as soon as angiogram is done, we saw that there was perforation. The first thing you'll do is that balloon will go immediately to the proximal part or where the perforation was, and you will dilate the balloon so that there will be no further dye going out. And that then you start thinking other things. So four to five things have to happen simultaneously when this happens. One, you got to stop the anticoagulation that uh, uh, has um, happened with the case. And then what you do, we did was you placed a, a you know, cover stand here because you know that you'll be able to place a cover stent. So as soon as you place the cover stent, the perforation stop. But before doing so, there are multiple other things that has happened. If anybody can recognize what else is there in the patient chest right now, there's a pigtail. So when that kind of um, perforation happens, your blood pressure usually goes to 30. So how are you going to ma manage the blood pressure? You immediately have to get a, a circulatory help or you give epi. Your neosin heparin is not going to help. You need to give bolus of epi so your blood pressure comes up. Your anticoagulation has to stop. And this is a one year follow up of this patient. That what happens if you see here, a cover stent was placed. The LED flow is very good. And you start seeing some circumflex flow, which is normal. Um, since it's a covered stent, it's uh, very difficult to go in. But there are cases where people do. Uh, you know, poke through that covered stent and try to open the circumflex. But since you are stable, we did not do anything. So this is a rotational atherectomy. We know it is an important device for calcific lesion, but the limitations are there. And one of the deadly complications of this device is the device itself or after the device, when you post dilate, you can see, see the perforation. So prevention is very important in coronary perforation. How do you say prevention? This was device related. Now, not rota itself, but after doing rota, when we place the balloon or the stent, it happens. So appropriate sizing is very important that do not oversize and do not go high pressures, what we are talking 20 to 24 uh, atmospheres that can give rise to perforation. Now, what is the clinical suspicion is that you know that um, may, most of the time, I can tell you, patients complain of acute chest pain because you have ruptured that artery, okay? And like I mentioned, sudden severe hypotension that uh, you see in these patients. So this is the key and there may be questions related to that. There will be saying that this happened. What is the first and foremost thing? Like I mentioned, the SDS that was in the guide, go inside and just place it uh, so that any further leak stops. Stop the anticoagulation. Whether you are using Angiomax or heparin, you can start uh, uh, anticoagulation. Now, reversal, okay? You got to be very cautious because you still are going to continue doing the procedure. You have to place a covered stent. So, you, you know, even if your reversal, do not reverse it completely. In bivalvulin, you cannot reverse. You just have to stop it. And if you want, you can call for fresh frozen plasma. You give intravenous fluid, but if the EF is low, you cannot do that. All this, uh, you can, you need atropine, you will give uh, um, epinephrine, other sec uh, mechanical circulatory vas, and definitely call for CT surgeon's help because there are cases where they may have to open the chest in the cath lab. And uh, important is that one skill everybody has to develop is learning how to do pericardiosynthesis because this is the time that you know that this particular uh, 
technique is the one that is going to save the patient because your blood pressure will be 30 because the, now the blood is collected in the pericardium. Um, and as soon as you do the pericardial synthesis, your uh, pressure immediately comes up. Then how do the fellows learn how to do pericardial synthesis is that you um, do these cases, uh, elective cases, because there will be elective cases of a lot of a pericardial effusion that comes. Uh, so fellows should learn how to do pericardial synthesis in the elective cases so that during emergency situation, they know how to do it. This is the third case that uh, I wanted to show you, which is another one was August uh, 2018 CCC live case, uh, 73 year old male. Um, again, uh, if you see here, multiple uh, comorbidities, but more important is that uh, he had uh, atrial fibrillation and then pulmonary fibrosis. So he came for cardiac cath. He had uh, three vessel disease with the left main bifurcation, uh, uh, RCA disease, syntax score was 34. So normally in this situation, what you do, you've got to take the patient out of the room. Patient should go and have a consultation with the surgeon, what is called a heart team discussion. And then a decision happens what is the right thing for the patient, but uh, surgeons declined because of pulmonary fibrosis. His FEV1 was uh, very low and uh, RCA-PCR uh, was done. He comes for LAD-PCR. So if you see here, the right side picture is very important. Same, heavy calcium. Okay, so there is left main circumflex and LAD diagonal disease with heavy calcium. So this is just, uh, you can just watch this video. So if you see here, I'm doing rotational atherectomy and the rotational atherectomy with 1.75 bar was being done. So technique is very important, no pectin technique. And what is the silence for? We were uh, only 150,000 RPM. So the bar is stuck. Only two people realized that. That was myself and Dr. Sharma. And how are we going to attempt to retrieve it? So the rotational atherectomy has diamond chips only in the front part of the uh, rota. So we are trying, let's go high pressure balloon and try to take it out, not high, uh, um, you know, to the rota and take it out, does not happen. Guide, guide is all the way. We already had a seven French guide, so it was uh, easy to put a seven French guide liner. So why this, um, you see that it's a bar is stuck in the calcium, right? So the guide liner is all the way very close to the uh, um, bar, then the guide is all the way inside. Right now we are desperate, okay? We don't care if it dissects the left main, we just need to pull, 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 look at the amount of pressure. Now see what happened. Why did the patient uh, hand move? It caused some chest pain. So this is what happens. What I call is artery is in pieces. So that is why we said we have the wire ready. So with the fielder fine cross, we wired, then we put uh, stents everywhere, and this is the final result. So if at all this happens, stuck bar, like we showed you, apply, forceful pull on the rota and the guide. So what you do is first you remove the guide, but later on we saw you, we engaged the guide and did it. You can give some vasodilators, it rarely works. Number three also rarely works, but if you uh, read uh, literature, they do say get another access, go side by side, put up. I mean, first of all, you did rotational atherectomies because there was so much calcium. So three doesn't usually happen, but what we showed is the one that normally happens. So we already had a seven French guide, very easy, cut the rota, go with the guide liner, guide liner are very close to the bar, get the guide up to the bar and then keep pulling, pulling till you get it out. 
six French. If you do have a six French, then what you have to do is you have to remove the Teflon sheet. Means you really have to aggressively remove the Teflon sheet from the rotor. Then you advance the six French guide liner. Then you remove the entire device. If you think you cannot do it, surgeon has to come there and remove it or take the patient to the OR. The main reason, despite doing it so carefully, um, uh, rota but rarely can get stuck. So that is why the uh, optimal RA technique, which was published, has to be done. A bar to artery ratio, uh, RPM not more than uh, 150,000 RPM. Uh, gradual bar advance, short pecking motion, not just you keep pushing the bar. And short ablations, avoid deceleration. Even you here, there is a deceleration of more than 5,000 means it is hitting resistance. So stop it. So that we may, you may have to downsize the bar and just do a polish run after. And these are the important preparatory steps. But before you start these three steps of unlock, disengage hemostatic valve, and tap the foot paddle with the Dyna Glide is the key. You have to do these three steps. If you don't do this, the rotor bar will jump and have, have the uh, complication of dissection. The fourth case I'm going to show you, subsequently I'll talk, you, talk through what is called as a complicated web app that we created and we released it this week. Uh, uh, it so happened uh, just during this uh, course. So this is a 63 year old male um, who has had prior, um, you know, cath, bypass surgery and has a lima that is occluded, but all that is patent is a vein graft from the RCA2. Uh, OM. So a um, uh, lot of uh, comorbidities. Um, these are the kind of cases we see now in the cath lab. The patients are with multiple comorbidities, multiple strands. This is an EKG. Uh, why I'm showing this is this is how this complicated uh, website has been made. Every case there is a nice uh, history, EKG, and an angiogram showing pertinent details of the cardiac cath. So this is a vein graft, which is a Y graft from the RPDA to the OM. On uh, below is the RCA, which is a significant disease. So the graft is patent, but on the left side, significant uh, the distal left main disease, uh, OM disease, as well as uh, LAD where the lima is gone. So of course, patient uh, was referred for PCI of this uh, uh, complex, I would say left main, LAD, ramus, and circumflex. Very rarely we use three wires because the presence of three wires can cause thrombus formation no matter how uh, you have anticoagulation. But here, since Ramos was important, we had to do that. We balloon the LED, balloon the circ, and guess what? Total standstill. That there's thrombus formation uh, with this, in this case, acute circulatory collapse, patient again, same thing, developed into VT, VFib, uh, needed a cardioversion. Um, and then we placed a balloon pump, uh, we knew because there was wire already there, we were able to dilate and uh, place a stent in the left main to LED. Um, now, what are the causes for, of a circulatory collapse like this? Two things it will be either di you caused a large dissection or dissection plus thrombus that created this. So what you do is you try to you know, open it with a balloon, you see there's a flow and then immediately place a stent and that's what we did. Now, once we place a stent, there is a flow in the LED lab uh, we wanted, but uh, the circumflex is occluded. So we were able to rewire it and then balloon the circumflex, place a stent, and then do kissing balloon. Now, what we're trying to show is, and why thrombus was a culprit, you see that uh, uh, on the top here, well, I'm trying to show that there is thrombus right here. You can see the thrombus in the uh, distal LED. So left main, dissection plus thrombus, and when you place the stent, what happened to the thrombus? Went downstream. When you see thrombus like that, what do you want to do? Take a wire. Now the wire is way in the mid to distal LED in the subtle. You go all the way down with the wire and dislodge the thrombus. If you want, you may be able to take, you know, remove it with a 2-0 balloon so that that thrombus has to be removed. And this is the final kissing balloon. One thing we lost is the ramus. The ramus that was there is completely gone. Whenever a complication has happened in the cath lab, uh, or always do an EKG before the patient comes out so that you have an idea. If there is a periprocedural EKG changes, you can then decide, do you want to give extra um, you know, uh, anticoagulation, stronger to be 3A, right, right now you have Cangidlor, um, you want to you know, upgrade to any kind of uh, other uh, uh, you know, hemodynamic uh, support. Now, 
this is where I think uh, very important for the fellows where we designed this, you can log in and watch, uh, see this cardiologyapps.com. And there, when you go in, you will see what is called as complicate. And what it is called as web app. So when you go to apps, when you press, you will see the various apps that you have created, but complicate app has just come out. And what is that called as a, called as web app? What's the meaning of the web app? Means it's mostly in the website because there are uh, over a, uh, 70 to 80 interventional complication cases. Whatever I've discussed, similar cases are out there depending on all the various categories that we have created. And each case, this is uh, what is called as um, acute vessel closure. If it is abrupt vessel closure, you see the educational content as well as case examples, case examples I'm showing you right now. Uh, so what is the reason of uh, abrupt vessel closure, whether it is uh, dissection or, or whatever reason, uh, you will see it. Now this is case number two, and then this is how I just explained. I showed you clinical presentation, past history, variables, what are the things that you can do on the site. It's called as education content, where you will learn what, what are the reasons, the basics of all the complications. So this is a case number five, is a 50 year old male who had angina class three, had anomalous RCA, significant disease, as well as um, LAD diagonal disease. So he did have PCI of the RCA. This is his EKG and he presented for the PCI of the LED. So radial uh, procedure, if you see, um, or he had a signal, like a moderate diagonal disease and uh, LED mid disease. So the operator decided they want to do a direct stenting. They placed a 318 millimeter uh, Zion stent. So AP cranial view looks good. And I always teach the fellows, you have, a procedure is not complete, uh, completed till you're done a second view. So they post dilated. And now you see the arrow that is the distal edge, the wire is out. And at the distal edge of the stand, you can see there is like a filling defect and the flow in the LED is like a TM2 or so. And the dissection uh, grade, which uh, is very important. This is could come as a part of your, uh, um, uh, you know, related uh, in the board that uh, E is per se the lumen defect, which you saw with the delay in anti-grade flow. And that's what it was. So in that situation, what happened? Look here. They waited a little bit longer. There was abrupt vessel closure because that dissection flap closed the vessel. Now, you know, in this situation that since it was a dissection, you want to rewire quickly. You can use the wire that you had or you can use the polymer jacketed wire, but once you wire through, you have to see what is happening in the lower where you could take with the balloon and make sure there's a flow. But what happened? You see some flow, but uh, the operator was not sure that um, is it uh, dissection or it is thrombus. So they went ahead and did what is called a thrombectomy. Uh, even then there was uh, flow was not normal. Then you do what is called as you take a micro catheter, which is usually the pronto, which is over the wire catheter, and you inject some dye in the distal vessel. So you see there's flow in the distal vessel. When you know there's flow in the distal vessel, then the uh, it is cannot be thrombus, it's a dissection. Okay. Uh, so you you know you have two differential diagnoses uh, because of that uh, acute vessel closure thrombus or the dissection, but now you see the flow distally, you know, dissection. And we also knew in that angiogram at the end that there was a dissection. So you place another stent and this is how the final uh, result is. So you can see the balloon pump placed uh, just because patient had ongoing chest pain. Again, post-procedure EKG before the patient comes out and uh, no difference. So case number six, showing a patient of car who had a cardiac cath, uh, LAD disease, as well as RCA disease with a syntax score of 13. Uh, patient underwent a successful PCI of the RCA and then was on left on medical therapy, came back because of ongoing uh, symptoms. Now, very important, the ischemia was only inferior, okay? So you left a 70% LAD lesion on medical therapy, patient comes back, and this is how it looks. Now, if you see here, the majority of the lesion is after the diagonal origin uh, uh, and maybe a 50% before, but diagonal angiographically looks uh, uh, non-obstructive. So in this situation, you have to do a physiological testing uh, since uh, 
a patient ischemia was only in a different territory. So uh, rightly so, LADFFR was positive. So you will go ahead and take care of that, pre-dilate it. So when you pre-dilate, you see that the bottom part is not well expanded. So went ahead and did uh, with a cutting balloon. So looks okay, placed a long stent. And guess what happens? Side band occluded, right? Now, to begin with, there was no side branch disease. Now, should we have placed a wire uh, in the side branch um, after doing a PTCA of the main vessel? Um, most people will do it. So this is the question that we ask, why I lost this side branch and what should I have done instead? If uh, most people know it or do not know it, you can download it right now. We have an app called Bifurcade app, management of all the bifurcation lesion and how to tackle it. So it is free to download either from the app store or Google store. So when you download the app, it will ask you a question. Most important question is left main bifurcation or non left main bifurcation. So this is the non left main bifurcation and then Medina classification. So Medina classification was 110. So the side branch had no disease. What was the side branch diameter? Was about 2.5. So it is 225.275. And the app does mention wire the side branch. Okay. So I should have wired the side branch. Now you did not wire the side branch. Same thing like I mentioned on the complicate, there is a basic section. It will tell you various ways of uh, handling means same difficulty in wiring side branch what are the wires you need to pick what are the techniques uh, that you have to do if you are difficulty in wiring you have wired it but now you are difficulty in uh, passing a balloon into the side branch it will give you all the tips and tricks how to do it uh, just with the, just bullet points and very easy so uh, uh, you know before the procedure you want to have a quick review you can do that so what you have to do in this situation that when you have vessel closure, the technique is called as T tap, that is T stenting and protrusion. That is a tap technique, which I'm de describing here. So mini track, 2012 balloon. Initially, you wire the side branch with a fielder and then you dilate it with a larger balloon. And that's exactly what the app is also telling you. And then you place a stent in the side branch, which was a 2712 millimeter Promus Premier. So this is exactly, you will place the side branch uh, stent here with a part of the stent sticking in the side, you know, this part of the wall, but it's a single layer of carina that is caused by the stent uh, because we are now trying to protrude into the main vessel. The reason we have to protrude so that the ostium is completely covered. So the issue with the bifurcation stenting Achilles heel is that always they, there's ostium restenosis. So you have to make sure the ostium is well covered and then finally do the KBI technique. And this is how it looks in the final angiogram. You can take two views to confirm everything in this particular case. So just uh, to conclude here of the various complication that I have been uh, uh, going through, uh, some of the complications that I have uh, gone through, and I do not want anybody to be scared because of the uh, burr entrapment, the perforations, and uh, those called catastrophic complications that I have shown, is if you want to go to uh, become an uh, extremely um, competent interventionist, you have to know how to handle this complication so that you will take over tougher and tougher cases. So uh, you may not see these complications, in your, uh, but you have to know the theory. If this happens, what are the steps I need to do? That is why anticipate that this is the case, this is a complicated uh, case that I want to do, but these are the complications that may happen if it happens, these are the one, two, three steps that I have to do. So similarly, I've shown you dissection, some slow flow, and uh, one thing is osteal lesion. If there's damping, don't inject. You could cause a guide, uh, cause uh, uh, dissection, thrombus formation, coronary wire perforation. I showed you device perforation. So a lot of things can happen and be prepared. So be prepared. What uh, we are trying to tell you is you got to have the important equipments in your lab so that you know you can tackle these com uh, complex cases. The important equipments are covered stent, coil, pericardiosynthesis tray, and all kinds of your um, you know, LVSS device so that you can use them when things go wrong and never ever feel shy to call for senior help that you want to do something complex, go you know, do simple, 
watch all these cases which are on the, on our website uh, so everything is written uh, and explained how to do them and you want to do them always you have a senior attending discuss the case and just have uh, their help by the side saying that if things go wrong don't feel shy call for the senior attending help so that you know that you are able to take care of these uh, complex cases so again i'm showing you now new york state complication is what it is and i want to show you the complications of mount sinai which is with the red bar um, showing those uh, you know the complex cases that we have been doing and what the complication um, uh, right here this is acc and ncdr compared to the mount sinai most of this complication like i mentioned i would urge the fellows to go to cccliveCases.org and watch all the cases um, uh, they are archived so you can do it at your own time and watch them either through the web uh, on the web or uh, or on the youtube so this is the total uh, web pages we have had multiple because they have watched all over the uh, world and these are the youtube also it is available on the youtube so over a million uh, hits we have had so far and this is the cardiology apps where you can see the various apps for the calcificate transeptate octate uh, now bifurcate i went through and uh, complicate is the web app uh, which uh, you have the two cases that i showed you are from there but you can go and see most of the cases there those are out there so these are the apps uh, which i uh, you can download and same thing with the oct many people would love to know how to do octs um, basics of oct and there are quiz of, of and various images uh, so you learn how uh, oct image should uh, uh, look whether it is uh, you know in all various kinds of uh, cases um, are there and we keep uploading uh, cases after cases and other thing is calcificate which i just mentioned uh, which is rotational atherectomy orbital atherectomy laser when to use what how to do it what are the steps and uh, whether uh, how to do the barrett entrapment i showed you so this everything has been explained uh, in this and the upcoming apps would be that um, the bifurcate 3d which is i will going to show you slowly and uh, the next and guide wire which would be uh, one thing that i also find and for fellows now you will if you ask me why have all this are coming out is because fellows ask me these questions and they want the help here and they want to know more because one thing i feel most fellows are not competent when they come uh, when they are doing their fellowship to understand their devices like i mentioned you to become very competent in what you are you got to know your devices so you got to know your wires you got to know your balloons you got to know your uh, uh, stents so that you know when things go wrong you are calling for the right things because everybody is in a heightened state your uh, adrenaline is way high up and wrong things can happen if you are calling for a wrong device so you got to know the your devices so guide wire give will give you an insight into various uh, guides and uh, STEMI catheter is something that I will uh, discuss also. So, what is bifurcate 3D? Is the bifurcate itself? When I did, was lot of it was uh, 2D images that I just showed. And then what happened is many people, uh, you know, requested, can you, uh, you know, show us exactly how this can be done? But that was my imagination also that I think if they can have a 3D view. of exactly how procedure have to be done like you see here um that they will able to be understand the procedure well so again same thing you have basics this is how you will see uh, ballooning uh, uh, techniques of uh, various techniques of bifurcation step by step uh, uh, on a video the uh, animation here um now stemi catheter uh, is uh, more of uh, uh, transportation as well as um, communication platform when you have a stemi based on american heart association guideline and uh, lifeline uh, you know mission lifeline uh, uh, guidelines uh, which is another important uh, you know uh, part of interventional cardiology is they are, we all like to do stemi cases Uh, since we are saving lives that's one case where you know you have done everything right that you are able to save patient's life so uh, this is a communication platform which uh, what i'm showing you is you can raise alarm ekg is uploaded 
and then you do a video call with your uh, emergency physician and then you accept it you can see the gps tracking if the patient is coming via the ambulance these are the time stamp of when the alarm was raised what time the ed physician called you everything is all time stamped so when you are submitting your uh, you know pro project to the lifeline you don't have to worry and a chat between the various physicians the um, ed physician the ccl physician the fellows the nurses the technician they all are part of this uh, so that uh, right now everything is happening via pager phone calls or their text messaging which is not hipaa compliant all this is hipaa compliant uh, on this particular uh, uh, app so i want to stop here and i will be, i have some questions uh, if you want i can go through the questions or i will take your uh, questions uh thank you dr kini i think you can uh, go over with some questions and then okay. uh, i will ask you yeah q and a so question number 1 so i have focused mostly on uh, the complication uh, only is a 40 year old female uh with hypertension uh, uh, you know pre diabetes stress uh, mpi showed uh, rca territory and she was referred for angiography which showed 80% stenosis in the proximal uh, rc so now you see you uh, place a run through wire and uh, pre dilating with a 3o balloon um so now this is typical okay so when you are removing uh, the balloon probably the you know the guide inadvertently gets disengaged and wire position is lost so what this happens uh what will you do right so you take the balloon wire out and quickly reengage with the guide get rightly so maybe since you went ptca what you see acute vessel closure so what is the next best step will you do here now there's no flow in this vessel so what will you see uh, of course patient will have chest pain some ekg changes plus minus uh, blood pressure will uh, drop since it's rca which is a dominant you may develop a, you know bradycardia uh, you have to take care of that so uh, based on all that i have shown you right uh, would you give rapid uh, saline flush yes do not give if the blood pressure is dropping don't give vasodilators right now uh, in the patient why they talking vasodilator is same because if you think uh, it is thrombus or a uh, vessel closure you may want to do that um, quickly deliver a stent and deploy it if you don't know what the vessel is doing don't do that uh, use the same balloon uh, repeat daughter again once you have wired it you have to be 100% sure you already know the why the vessel closed is because you did ptca and probably there's a dissection not knowing where you are don't go and balloon dilate and what if you were in, uh, in uh, uh, the dissection plane so d pro probably is the right one which i had shown you that uh, you know the angiogram where you are not sure you take a dual lumen catheter inject some dye in the distal um, and confirm that you are in the distal lumen once you are done that then you give some vasodilator then you do the balloon and then you do the stent so those are the steps so exactly i think i'm mentioning all that and going through step by step all the questions i mean exactly what we did but i already show you showed you a uh, um, case also now question number 2 65 year old male with a history of hypertension hyperlipidemia diabetes cad multiple pcis um, refractory to angina despite on the maximum optimal medical therapy a coronary angiography showed a 60% distal lesion patient was appropriately anticoagulated with bivalvin whatever you did now what is the key step here they are asking is 60% so you know unless you are above 70 you do not want to 60 to 70 okay what you have to do with a 60 to 70 you have to do um ffr okay before you do anything so they do do ffr and uh, once we are doing it and uh, pulling the wire out um see your act was high 300 is right here is a higher act and the blood pressure was high and now you see blood pressure is starting to go down heart rate is starting to go up so there's something that has happened to the patient right you wired you did something um and uh, so of course you want to give dye and you see right first thing you want to do is see what happened to this case so when uh, you did that um, you will see some extravasation in the contrast uh, in the pda because of the wire so this is wire induced perforation now wire induced perforation usually should not cause a lot of problem 
when there is a wire induced perforation what do you normally do you you know leave the wire there place a balloon like i showed you in that other perforation case that you will take a balloon in the distal rca which may be now 3530 so you got to take a balloon that is one to one vessel size of the distal rca which will be either 3 or 35 either a 12 mm 15 do not go with the high pressure low uh, why you want one to one balloon because you want low pressure inflation so you go with the balloon dilate that uh, stop the anticoagulation i mentioned that even uh, st stop the anticoagulation and wait 5 to 10 minutes if the patient tolerates and the, usually the wire perforation disappears in this case what uh, they are saying is there is a, a blush blush could be that there is a dye staining into the myocardium uh, or go going into some kind of a, a you know cavity in that situation what happens is that um, they are saying use a catheter micro catheter to uh, embolize it you are not going to put a covered stent in rpd is a small vessel so we are not sure you absolutely don't need a cts consultation uh, unless you are not able to handle it uh, you want to call because you know you just want a surgeon by your side you can do it but these things you should be able to handle it yourself um of course we said dc anticoagulation uh, balloon inflation all these things uh, pericardial synthesis do not do pericardial synthesis not knowing that you have confirmed that there is a fusion because you could be hitting the rv if there is not enough fluid in there so one other thing that i want to recommend which i probably have to tell you that in the anticipation and have your equipment you got to have a portable echo machine in your room so that you do the echo yourself you're not waiting for the echo doctors to come what if it's happening at 10 pm uh, there's no echo doctor uh, in the hospital to do that so you, for this things either a, uh, you yourself or fellow should be able to put the a probe on the chest and diagnose that there is a fluid so that you will be able to do the pericardial synthesis so likely answer here if they are asking you all of the above would be that because that there is a flow um uh, no because the patient is becoming hypotensive and all that that you do a um you know coil embolization going to question number 3 um is same another 8 year old male diabetes hypertension tobacco use um, uh, had several found to ha have multi vessel disease referred for cabbage but patient declined uh, and came to your facility for a um, complex pci uh, echocardiogram showed ef of 20% impella guided pci of the left main rotabar um, so multiple techniques were so this is very the thing is that you got a stuck bar right which of the following is not considered optimal so, so sometimes you have to read through the questions because they are complex but look at the final question what is the uh, optimal rotational arthrectomy technique so these are the technique that i think which we uh, mentioned that you have to be very clear that you do the rotor right and this technique four five technique has to be embedded uh, in your brain so maximum bar to artery ratio 0.4 to 0.6 we agree rotation arthrectomy speed 150000 rpm um, and higher speed only if uh, you know cannot cross that's that's what we say so 150000 rpm yes do it bar advancement with steady pressure is that what we taught bar advancement with steady pressure no we said packing motion slow and uh, you know short packing motion 20 seconds ablation avoid deceleration and final polishing run of the so everything is right so likely what is not right is what c good that's the wrong one uh this is a case uh, well, i think uh, number 4 this is the last one i will show you uh, so you see that 5 cc column of air was inadvertently injected uh, this is this questions Uh, are oftenly shown to you guys or they will show you an angiogram with a little bubble that is going in the rca or a little bubble in the side branch so look for that uh, that saying that after angiogram they'll show you the uh, a patient has a uh, you know collapse uh, what do we do or what is the diagnosis so when there is an uh, collapse without any known cause uh, just with an angiogram the diagnosis is air embolism so vigorous flushing with saline vaso dilators uh, for no flow slow flow so this one is something that you have to be very careful because if the pressure is low do not give vaso dilators what you need is 
you give you know phenylephrine atropine and all these things so we got a flushing so that air runs away okay um, that that is a very important thing now you got to get your blood pressure high essentially it has to be that your pressure across aorta as well as distal flow is, is so high that air has to disappear uh, people have uh, explained that you go put a catheter and then aspirate of uh, the air or go with the wire uh, dislodge air uh, from with the wire those things usually don't work but very important get your blood pressure high and in rare cases it is true collapse immediately put in a balloon pump so this is the key that you have to know give um, you know neosinephrine if neosinephrine does not work have uh, epinephrine ready not the ampule of epinephrine that you are using uh, during your resuscitation use one in 10000 you know dilute it with 1 cc uh, to 10000 10000 you take the 1 cc and then inject it that is how you bring your blood pressure up and once you bring your blood pressure up and you keep flushing the air will uh, completely disappear uh that's what you have to know this is uh, the, the various way of um, uh, uh, you know mechanism of how you manage uh blood pressure management bradycardia management and in rare cases insert a balloon pump so some question uh, related to uh, air embolism always is there um, in the boards so i think we can take more questions from the fellows thank you dr kiran that was really excellent um i do have some questions i'll go through quickly um so if you do not have a lucas device and if you're doing manual cpr um uh, and if you have acute vessel vessel closure then do you do do you hold cpr for pci or do you do the pci during the 2 minute cycle you got to continue so you will have one you are, that's why i said call for help you will have couple of fellows technicians they will help uh, so uh, help you so why i said uh, try to invest on a lucas device uh at least a few cases we have lost everything went fine later on they go back to the ccu and then you find out they are bleeding in the belly because the rib has perforated the spleen the liver something has happened so lucas is a very uh, is a uh, you know device that really helps um, the the patient in the sense it is a, a atraumatic and nice compression pressure is here that guy i can tell you the first case where i showed with the cardiopulmonary collapse uh, ecmo the we resuscitated for almost an hour the live case i showed you he went home is only because during lucas his pressure was completely maintained but at the what also can happen if your pressure is low and you don't have cerebral perfusion later on they don't wake up so that is something you need to invest uh, in and of course if the administrators are not ready to put the money in you just have to continue uh, uh, so you will see uh, compressions and uh, everything has to happen otherwise you will have no blood pressure during the uh, the whole uh, case uh, the second question i have is uh, during pci if you have a uh, dissection when patient is hemodynamically stable uh, do you act before things get worse or do you wait no uh, go ahead that means depends if it is a type a you would want to leave it type c and above you got to take care um so you know suppose it was a very complex uh, case and you put already three stents now you have a little small distal edge dissection of the distal rca very difficult to get the things down there and uh, you have a type b dissection leave it and uh, you know people do consider to be 3a or a stronger antiplatelet uh, agents now yeah what uh, we call uh, the liquid stent it's called liquid stent i'll just take one last question uh, and uh, for in case of air embolism uh, do you recommend using high flow oxygen you yeah oxygen is important you can give high flow oxygen but the other thing uh, i mentioned has to be done just oxygen is not going to take care of the air embolism you have to do something to take care of the i mean the, for the oxygen to for the air to go away and i think uh, there was one one more comment here um in the setting of dissection uh, uh, there was a comment that some operators recommend against injection uh, injection means the distal vessel right the one i showed you you're talking about that uh, i believe so that was the question yeah as you know but the operators believe that your dissection can propagate yes but as long as you know that your wire went easy and you have this vessel go 
um, your, uh, you know, the pronto catheter go easy, they're not pronto, you mean uh, you can take a twin pass, twin pass probably is a better catheter to go distally, this, I mean, uh, cautiously you can inject, nothing wrong, I, wish I showed you the case, uh, you know, how you are to do it, as long as you follow that uh, steps, I think you'll be okay, but yes, people will be, will tell you don't do it, uh, since you're not sure whether the, where or what the distal vessel, which part of the distal vessel you are uh, with the wire. Thank you very much, Annapurna. That was an excellent review, very educational. Uh, you know, it was an amazing talk. Thank you very much. We understand how busy you are and we appreciate uh, your time and your commitment to fellow education. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to move on to um, a case discussion. So if you could join with us and stay with us for the case discussion. Uh, and I'm, uh, thank you, Sandeep, again for joining us. Poonam is going to lead the case discussion. Dr. Poonam Velagapudi is a structural interventional cardiologist and assistant professor of medicine and associate program director for cardiology uh, medicine fellowship at the University of Nebraska. Her clinical interests include high-risk PCI, mechanical circulatory support in shock, radial and large bore access, or cutaneous transcatheter valve procedures, including TAVR, uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement, and mitral clip. She's the chair of the early career section of the ACC, and she was the past chair of the ACC section, and she is going to do her case discussion. Over to you, Poonam. Can you see my slides, uh, Mavi? Yes, we can see your slides. Yep. Okay, awesome. Um, so a lot of presentations today were, um, I will cover, you know, cover a lot of points. Um, today's presentation in my case, this is an old case that I did as a fellow, uh, but has a lot of teaching points and with uh, Sandeep and Dr. Kini around, I think we'll have um, a good discussion. So I'm presenting the 65 year old woman who presented to us with unstable angina. Um, so she was having worsening angina for about a week and uh, now came on at rest and so comes in at daughter's um, request. And this is her past medical history, has CAD, uh, prior uh, stent in her mid-LAD in 2006, hypertension and hyperlipidemia. So not really, she's kind of a healthy lady um, and uh, her exam was normal. Um, this is an EKG, um, really nothing that would stand out. And these are her labs, her uh, creatinine is normal, hemoglobin is normal, and her trope is negative. And so this is her diagnostic angiography. Um, this is the right with maybe some um, moderate lesion in her um, distal to distal RCA. And the point of interest is um, this. So this is her left system. Um, You can see she had that media lady stent um, and there is um, high grade stenosis both proximal and uh, immediately distal to that stent. And then you can also see some uh, low flow here. So at this point, I, I, I'll ask you, um, Sandeep or Dr. Kini, um, what are you thinking? How, how would you manage this patient um, technique wise? Um, this really tortuous vessels, um, really, how would you manage this uh, case? So if you see in your caudal picture, uh, there's significant uh, LAD coming up all the way up to the ostium uh, with maybe a 10, 20% of the distal left main involved. So you have to be very cautious when you place the stent that um, how your technique is going to be, that are you going to come into the left main because that's a technique that we can see this, you know, like less than 30% left main that you want to cover the left main so that you're, you know, later on you can take care of the circ or you have to be very careful, just take care of the ostium itself. And, uh, you know, this LED distal is a stent edge. Uh, that's up to you how you want to, you know, to take, you know, handle it. You can just do a, a cut. You definitely need a, a, not at um, atherectomy definite atherotomy, otherwise that fibroelastic lesion will not open up. So you wire it and, uh, you know, balloon it um, completely and then take care of the lesion. What stent was the uh, uh, LAD stent? Um, it was a promis. Okay. So then you will want to use a different kind of a stent when you're handling that. Um, but, uh, you know, people who are uh, rotational atherectomy users may say, this has significant disease. I mean, it does not look 
um, very tortuous here in the proximal that they may want to do distal edge uh, otherwise just uh, yeah okay I think I think the osteal uh, lesion would really benefit from some imaging. You know, once you get the the mid open and uh, you know things are stable, I think uh, you know to the point that Dr. Kinney made, uh, there's definitely extension of disease there, and really understanding you know how much extension of disease, how much compromise of the left main there is. I also think that you know, however unlikely it is to snowplow that uh, circ shot, you can't afford to snowplow that circ uh, uh, when you're fixing the osteal LAD. It's a it's a huge vessel and you're going to have to protect that as well. So agreed. Um, I think all that, all that, all those points are um, important points. Um, so in summary, um, we talked about this woman who's an unstable angina and so decided to proceed with um, an intervention of the LAD. And so since we had the right radial axis, we just used an EBU 3.5, um, really did not give us good support it would push the, you know, any wiring forward would push the guy back. And similarly, when we tried to pass the IVIS, it was very poor support. Um, so on IVIS, uh, I just have uh, information that the distal left main, you know, the left main was area-wise more than six, uh, the ostium as well as distal. Um, it would not pass beyond the proximal LAD, Sandeep, as you uh, said, we have to IVIS this uh, vessel. The ostium of the left circ was not significantly diseased. So at this point, would you agree that we would proceed with a provisional technique standing from the LAD to the left main and then, you know, open up the circuit if it was compromised or do you have any other um, ideas or thoughts? Was there, was there calcium there? Do you, do you have a sense of why it wouldn't? Is it a guide support issue, coaxiality issue, wire, or is it actual disease? I think it was the tortuosity and then the, it was getting stuck at the proximal stent struts. I think the Stent might have been underexpanded, and it was getting stuck at that. You could feel the resistance. So I, I would, uh, I mean, I'm, I like the idea. You're switching it to femoral, um, but, uh, and then I would go with the seven French. Um, just you know, if there is no issue with the access, go seven French. Um, your thought will be provisional, but you don't know how the circ will behave once you start intervening in the LED. So you be ready that you may want to do a uh, you know, two stent technique of the left main. So at that time, you know, you have a uh, you know, large guide and not struggling. Yeah, that's yeah, an important you know, point. Yeah, seven French should have been um, a good choice, but we uh, went through the six French. Sorry, Sandeep, you were saying something. No, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think more support, more uh, um, real estate is, is better for this kind of intervention, but I personally would have probably stuck with radial, but uh, swapped up to uh, an Asahi Ocath, um, you know, seven, uh, seven French radial system. Um, they're rigid, uh, but they do give, uh, you know, once you're coaxial, they do give a lot of really good support. Great points. Okay, so um, again, we did not use atherectomy, uh, the rota regret. Uh, balloon dilated the proximal um, and mid LED 2.5, 3.0 and then um, went ahead and put in two stents, distal uh, to proximal, 2538 and 3532 into the left main. Now, we, we post dilated. So the wire was pulled out from the circumflex before um, the stent was placed in the left main. And then we said, we tried to pass the wire back into the circumflex, would not pass. And so I was sure that the stent was underexpanded. And so we went ahead and post dilated the LED 3.5 and then the mid LED with 3.0. And you can see that we're trying to wire back. But here is a picture. It looked like it was well expanded. But then the next picture is when you, when you took a coaxial picture, then this is what we see. So um, then, um, you know, at that point, um, that was a still image, but this is what we have. So now, um, what what should we be doing? What steps? What comes first? Um, thoughts? So here uh, you see the differential diagnosis. Uh, when we went, uh, same thing. This is guide-induced uh, left main dissection. Uh, so that dissection has gone, unfortunately, into the circumflex. Um, so the, the only way right now is that your guide is okay, 
uh, don't know what's a pressure because it looks like a, it was a large circumflex. Um, you may have to get your blood pressure, you know, maintained, and you have to get a try to wire into the circumflex, and um, you know, take care of the left main to circumflex. So the, how would you handle this is the same. You will wire into the LED, wire into the circumflex, and then you know, balloon into the circumflex. Then you stand from left main to circumflex. Then you do the pot and kiss and I was again. So in, in now that the circumflex is down, Rakini, what are, how should we be, what wire should we use? You, isn't there a risk of going into the uh, false lumen? Um, what should we yeah. do? No, no, a risk of going into false lumen is there, but right now you've got to put a wire into the LED, make sure that remains uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So that way guide also will remain stable. I think uh, your fielder whisper, whatever you're comfortable with, any kind of a, uh, you are a polymer jacketed wire, you should be able to get into the circ with those uh, wires. Now, you're telling it was angulated and if you're not able to wire and you know, your part of the stent strut is now sticking into the circ, you know, usually uh, if you're doing a osteo stent, uh, invariably half millimeter of the stent or something could be in the left knee. Does not matter. Um, you still, one of these wires you should be able to get in. If not, you, if you still cannot get your wire down there, it's not just going into the right lumen because with the current angle, you may not be, you might have to use a super cross, you know, venture something for you to get in. But usually with a nice circumflex curve, you should be able to get in with the, this polymer jacketed wires. Sandeep, any um, recommendation? What, what would you do about support? Should we be wiring this and stenting it first or should we be thinking about putting in some support and then wiring? What should we be doing in terms of support? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I support what, uh, I agree with what Anupurna just said. Uh, you've got to control the LAD. I think, you know, there's a moment of panic here, obviously, um, but a couple of, couple of points, right? They're still flowing the LAD. The flap, I think, is controllable. You know, I personally would take some soft, um, uh, either a soft tip wire or something that's, uh, you know, more of a workhorse wire, create a nice big bend on it and see if you can just sort of knuckle it through into the LAD and stay clear of things. And then you've got control of that. The other point is that you haven't stented across the circ by virtue of the fact that the uh, guide dissection actually took the circ out. There's a good amount of circ osteum that, uh, that succumbed to this. So you should be able to get in. It's not behind uh, it's not behind metal. Um, I had a case like this where, uh, very recently, where um, the uh, the uh, FFR wire, the IFR wire, actually dug right into the the floor of the RCA and uh, took out a four and a half millimeter RCA uh, with a huge dissection. Unfortunately, uh, the person pushing the wire didn't really notice that, and we uh, essentially just backed the guide out. Just uh, Left that wire in the in the false lumen, pinned the guide, backed that out, and then blind wired it from the uh, from the osteum. Once you control the LAD, then you've got a variety of different options. Uh, you can use a directional catheter, or you can also use a twin pass. Once you have the LAD wire, put the twin pass there and use that to sort of probe that area. Or uh, uh, Asahi Intech has a new uh, catheter called Sasuke, which you can use as well. So. Um just a quick question is why we thought this was a, a dissection from uh, aggressive post dilation. Do you think it's more a guide dissection? I suppose yeah, it could uh, be either. Yeah, no, I think the way you see the C cap there, it is a guide induced dissection because with your balloon, um, you, you should not see an extension. You use a 3O, 3 5 balloon. But the left wing is, uh, you know, like a 4 oh high, bigger than 4 oh. So I don't think no matter how high pressure you've gone, uh, it's unlikely it's called uh, due to balloon dissection. So um, you... How was the patient doing, uh, uh, Puno? The patient at this point was still stable, just started to complain of chest pain. Um, and then, so like you both suggested, the first thing was to protect the LAD, save that. And so we did wire the LAD and then quickly put a stent um, in, into the left main and covered the proximal dissection. So again, um, at this point, she started having ST elevations in her lateral leads, became hypotensive, um, required, you know, pressors and then respiratory distress. At this point, we had to stop and then intubate. Um, and then 
we needed support uh, first. And so put in um, the impeller, and then we started working on the replica. So you see some flow down the cert. The wiring wasn't um, that easy. You used a feeder X, XT, and um, as Dr. Kinney suggested, used a fine cross. Um, um, and then we kind of tried to get that wire down. So got it down the vessel, though we couldn't get it into the distal vessel, and then ballooned it. And here we um, you know, couldn't deliver the stent, uh, then had to use a guide liner and then delivered. Finally, that helped. And so we put the stent in in a T, uh, T fashion. And so that's, that's what we got. So you can still see that the dissection is still extending distally. So what would you do at this point? Do you go after that? Seems like there's a vessel mismatch. Um, what, what would you suggest at this point? See now, remember this is the question I think uh, uh, Subda had asked earlier. You know, what's the kind of dissection that you think you would want to leave? So this dissection, which is the distal edge of this long circumflex stent in that uh, OM, look at your wire. What we call is a black wire angioplasty, or I call it as a cliff angioplasty, where you cannot go further down. Um, this kind of dissection. Uh, I know it is uh, greater than C, but you, that is something you would want to leave. You will be very hard because right now you have to take care of the left main because your gu guideliner probably has made it worse now. Um, so you've got to focus on left main to surf uh, before you think what you will you do to that distal area. As long as you know the distal area will remain the same, later on maybe you can put a balloon for a long PTCA and you know tack it up. Um, once this uh, stent is done, focus on the left main now. Great. So that's what we did. Um, kissing balloon inflations, the proximal stent was part of that. And so this is what we have. And like you suggested, Dr. Kini, we didn't see any flow limitation. It's distal. Um, it's in that, you know, curve, curve the tortuous portion. Um, and we we think that would heal. There's no flow uh, limitation, so we just um, left that alone. Um, and this is what we have. Uh, so you still can see that dissection flap, but the stent is already there, and so we just left it at this. Um, Did your osteal circ stent uh, cover that? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's extending, it's in a T fashion, um, extending into the uh, LAD stent into the left main and then we did a kissing balloon inflation and that that was where the dissection was but it's covered with a stent. No but left main is a different stent right? Left main is a different stent. There is one stent, can you see my arrow? One stent goes to here and then the left main stent is overlapping and this goes into it and I, I can play um, probably show you there. No because your circ stent there is a gap in the osteal circ now. There's a gap in the osteal cirque, and that's the dissection you're seeing. Like it's extending. You think there was no gap. We had extended it all the way to uh, the left main. And again, confirmed thyroids um, at the end. So. so that's what we left that at. And she actually. Um, did well, had normal ejection fraction and no wall motion abnormalities um, when she came back for a follow-up and she's on medical therapy. So any uh, suggestions in terms of, or recommendations in terms of what antiplatelet therapies you would recommend for this patient and for how long? Lots of antiplatelet for a long, long time. I, I think, you know, You've got you've got a lot of metal on metal uh, coverage, right? Uh, you've got several areas of overlap, and uh, you've got the flow limitation or the uh, the flap in the in the circumflex to worry about. It's uncommon for us to come back and uh, recap these folks just because. But I think that if you're deciding on discontinuing antiplatelet therapy any sooner than a year, she probably deserves a relook just to make sure that everything has actually tacked up. 
Um, I think after a year, I, I'd be pretty comfortable going to antiplatelet monotherapy. Uh, if she can tolerate it, maybe a bit longer. In hindsight, should we um, have done some rot rotational atherectomy or some sort of atherectomy with this patient? I personally don't think so. I mean, I, I tend to agree that this this looks like it's, you know, it could be one of two things. It could have either been, uh, you know, the guide dissection or uh, dissection with the big balloon, although I think guide dissection is sort of leading. And, you know, this is where I've gotten into trouble with radial intervention, where, you know, we don't have the support that we need and we're doing deep intubation maneuvers to deliver devices. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've lifted up a flap uh, proximally. Um, so I do think that that was probably the origin of this and, uh, you know, it got a, got a good result with it. So congratulations. Uh, so any final comments, Dr. Keeney? Um, I think case, like you're mentioning, uh, case, case planning was uh, very good, but uh, going back to your point, why did this dissection happen? Uh, uh, like Sandeep mentioned, of course, it was if it was radial, I would have said no guide support and the radial often, um, you know, they always try to get into the left main or circumflex. Uh, uh, but here you already switched on to uh, femoral. Now, other thing is you've asked the question, should we have done rota, which also we, you know, discussed in the early part. Since we did not do rota in uh, under expanded stent and you're trying to you know get the devices in and out and in and out could that cause this uh, did that cause the guide dissection likely could have happened so you know going backwards now you are worried that you it was tortuous vessel and you are not comfortable in doing rotational atherectomy something could have happened with the rotational atherectomy also in a tortuous vessel um as long as I think when you are doing oh, having this kind of, uh, you know, oh, prepara preparatory steps and you know that you, you are taking this particular step, you don't want to do rota because you're worried it's a tortuous uh, vessel, but you are going to do only balloon, but be ready that with balloon, you will still uh, probably have under expanded stent or uh, any other uh, complications like this that you, you had shown. Um, but I think the key part that you have, you, what you have shown is um, very important for the fellows to learn is the recognition, recognition of the complication, have your, uh, you know, thought process one, two, three, four, and just go through those uh, steps, which uh, you guys did. Um, and uh, that's the way it has to be. But this case, I don't remember how old the person was. Uh, nothing wrong in follow-up angiography because if restenosis has come back already, there's instant restenosis once. If there's restenosis back, then patient should go for bypass. Great points. Thank you so much. And we are at uh, 12.29. Uh, Dr. Ashwat, do you want to... One other point I want to tell you in this particular case for uh, you know patients for a long back, uh, they, this patient will belong to that because of multiple long stents and uh, uh, of the main areas though. So that, if that was your question, yes. Uh, if you think you are not going to bring her back for a angiography, just continue uh, after one year of a stronger antiplatelet therapy, uh, switch her to Plavix for at least two more years. Awesome. Thank you so much for staying on for the discussion and uh, giving your thoughtful input. Um, anything, Dr. Ashwat, are you on or we? I think she's. Thank you so much. And um, we look forward to having you more at the ACC lectures in future. Thank you very much, Poonam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anapurna and Sandeep. That was a great discussion and a great case. Really appreciate all your participation and all your contribution. Uh, we look forward to working with you all again, and thank you to all the attendees who joined us every Saturday, and I you know it's a lot of work, so we really appreciate you uh, joining in, and we also got a lot of positive feedback that helps us a lot, keeps us going, motivated, so thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the weekend, and uh, happy Ganesha Chaturthi for anybody who's celebrating. Hopefully, this is the end of all obstacles for us, and uh, enjoy the rest of the weekend. Stay safe. Yeah, happy Ganesha Chaturthi. Thank you. Happy Ganesh Chaturthi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.